and uh, why we should all support uh, the authorities as they uh, work around the clock to bring us a finality to end uh, the spread of the coronavirus. This uh, program is uh, uh, supported by Allied Oil. Allied Oil says, why pay more to drive more? At Allied, you pay less to drive more. Allied's Drive More Fuel is currently the lowest on the market. Drive to the nearest Allied Fuel service station and fill up the difference. Drive more, more kilometers at no extra cost. Allied with you all the way. We say a very big thank you to Allied uh, Oil for supporting uh, this very important program today as we seek to uh, bring to our audience uh, the very needed education on the coronavirus. We have our expert panel here, and the aim is to curb the spread of the coronavirus in Ghana. With us in the studio to my immediate right, Honorable Prosper Bani. Honorable Prosper Bani uh, is a former crisis management official with the United Nations, but he's also a former chief of staff under the presidency of former president John Mahama. Honorable Bani, we are grateful that you found time to join us. Thank you very much. Uh, seated next to uh, Honorable Bani is Professor Kobna Anan. Professor Anan is the director at the Nobuchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. Prof, we are grateful that yet again you found time to join us. Uh, you have been very friendly with GBC in the past days and we are grateful for your presence. Uh, next to him is another friend of GBC, is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Odame. Dr. Emmanuel Odame is a Director, Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Unit at the Ministry of Health. Uh, Doc, you are a very busy man uh, in, in, in these times where you still found time to come and educate our people. And uh, next to uh, Dr. Odame is uh, Honorable Dr. Kate Nawani. He is an MP, um, MP for NAPDAM, but uh, importantly, he is a medical doctor as well. Doc, we are grateful that you also found time to join us. We are hoping to be joined by the Deputy Minister for Health. When he does join us, we will uh, uh, introduce him to you and then we'll let him join the discussion. But um, this is what I want us to do. We've provided um, uh, uh, sanitizers uh, for, for everyone, uh, just so as to let our people know that in addition to washing their hands on a regular basis that it's also important that wherever they cannot find um, water and soap it's uh, alternatively they could rely on the hand, hand sanitizers um, I don't know um, um, on our possible bunny how, how often do you use the hand sanitizer I use hand, hand sanitizers regularly I have some in my car I have some in my Office and I have some at home, mm. so I use I use them regularly as well as washing hands. Uh, once I'm at home, the hand washing becomes a, a, a practice now, uh, which I do re regularly. Not only do I do it for myself, but I encourage others to do so in these times. Prof, um, you you were on our news and um, you dispelled a certain notion, Akpeteshi, and so on. I uh, used to, uh, um, but still, uh, people are rel I, I've been to a shop bar where Akpeteshi uh, is actually supplied in a makeshift uh, bottle where mm. you can pour and used to wash your hands. Is it helpful in any way? No, in actual fact, it's not very helpful. It's a dangerous thing to do because it can give you false hopes. You know, we can use alcohol as a sterilizer. And in the laboratory, actually, for example, at the University of Ghana, Noguchi Nomorans for Medical Research, that's what we use for sterilizing. But it has a specific percentage. You see, 70% ethanol. And there are different kinds of alcohols. You have to be careful which you choose. People can even choose methanol or something, which doesn't work. You see, So we really have to be careful in there population being encouraged to do their own thing that is not guided by expert advice. And then the alcohol appetite could contain so many impurities. When we prepare 70% ethanol for sterilization, we make sure that even the water we use is truly clean water, like the ionized water or uh, distilled water, you know, that kind of thing. So when you sterilize, you are sure that you have truly sterilized. Mm. Apetechi also, what is the percentage of even alcohol in it? Could be 40%, could be 50, could be 60, far below the recommended percentage. 
you know, that kind of thing. So it's not really a good thing to do. We okay. should be careful about it. Doc, I'm sure when we start uh, the discussion itself, you get to realize that there's a shortage of uh, sanitizers in town and um, where people cannot find running water, mm -hmm. then they depend on all other alternative mm -hmm. means that they believe will keep them safe. Uh, we'll get to that later. But Dr. Odami, um, I, I just spoke about a chop bar. In fact, I, I went there not necessarily to eat, but to observe as a journalist. And um, I did see that um, people washed their hands with water and soap, but ate from the same bowl. And I find that also, I may be wrong, but from a layman's point of view, as another dangerous source of contracting the virus, if indeed any of the people around had it, uh, would I be right in my assertion? Yeah, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to this show and to say good morning to the good people of Ghana. I think you are right, um, basic hygiene in our what we call choba in our local parlance. But I'm sure if you have been monitoring the movement, we've kept on saying clearly that this coronavirus battle is a whole of Ghana battle. What has happened in the last few days? Ministry of local government has sent a clear circular, and I'm sure you might have seen it. We've activated what we call the public health emergency committees, which are the district assembly, the district health people, the market people, going out into all those marketplaces, all those bills, bars. Because the good thing is that we have bylaws, clear bylaws. And I always say this coronavirus really is a wake up call to the basic hygiene standards which we have kept as a people. Because using even the same bowl to wash about five different hands. It's absolutely not acceptable. So we want to take this opportunity to really appeal to the Ghanaian public that this battle is about all of us. It's about those of us, we, no matter what we do, we have a part to play in this battle. So we appeal to our child bar owners that we should really, really make sure that like Prof said, even the water, the type of water, we should get extremely clean water to wash hands. Those who sell themselves, beyond really calling on them to use sterilizers, sanitizers and all that, really advise that they really should wash their hands regularly. Thorough washing of hands. And when I say thorough, I mean making sure you are going through every single point and really taking your time. Just as you are bathing a new baby. And the way we, we handle it to that, that level of care. But it's so critical because they will end up shaking hands and I'm getting water. In terms of food cooking itself, they should really warm the foods. And we also want to appeal to the Ghanaian public that as much as possible, let's also try and get foods which are a bit warm. So it shouldn't be extremely cold food. All right. So, Doc, again, um, I have so many questions, but the program hasn't even started <laughs> in detail yet. Because, you see, even the, the money, physical cash, and uh, marketplaces, uh, people collect the money with the hand. And the money has probably been to all sorts of places. We don't know what kind of contamination is on the, the physical cash that we, we circulate around. In our education so far, I find the handling of money missing. But in these times, money plays a very crucial role and so on. When we get to the meat of the details, uh, <laughs> I'd like you to address uh, that as well for us and how safely we can handle cash. But um, Doc, you are coming from Parliament. You are also a medical doctor. And we notice how quickly uh, you responded to the president's call to pass legislation to ensure that some of the measures that have been taken uh, are rooted in law. Um, we usually don't find Parliament acting that fast. Tell us what was mo the, the motivation. Okay, uh, let me first say good morning to the viewers of uh, GTV and uh, say good morning to, to my co-panelist and of course the host. Um, we are not in normal times. And any country that has not related to this particular outbreak or pandemic as if it's a wartime will definitely regret. Indeed, um, we need to take our decisions very, very fast. And decisions that we are taking, you know, sometimes if you are even taking them two weeks earlier, probably the effect will have been different from what is taking place now. And so Parliament is asking the government to accelerate its activities. We are asking the government to bring everything on board and whatever money that are 
expected to be released for the fight against coronavirus should be done with that sort of speed that we have done had it been a war where we had the generals in front, etc. And that is why uh, we sit, I think yesterday, I had to leave for a television program uh, around 8. on an hour to hour basis and let the real picture of what they are doing uh, come out. I always say that in these times the best way to win in Tobacco's war, I mean such a mm -hmm. war, is to be able to carry the population along with you. At the same time, we see the NIA, for example, continue to register people. Mm. Uh -huh. Is the NIA not obeying the president's instructions? What about the pastors? If they also disobey, what is going to happen? And that is what I'm saying, that we need to put our act together and carry the whole population along. Right. Um, and you're not the first person... Uh, or very briefly but we do have um, a short presentation as uh, a PowerPoint presentation sort of on um, measures uh, that should be taken uh, these are coming from health experts about things that we should do in these times and uh, things that also explain to us what the virus is. Uh, Selikem, you have the details. Uh, would right. you want to share that with us? Right. Of course, we have our experts here. Um, however, this is a, a no panic help guide mm. uh, provided uh, by the WHO, also um, approved by the CDC and other institutions as well, um, just to give uh, people a sense of what to do, what this coronavirus is. And so we'll just run through the presentation quickly and then our experts can speak to some of the facts right. and clarify some of the things mm. as well so we're starting from from the basics and um, I believe that shortly we'll have it super on our, our yes. screen so that uh, we can all take a look so we know that COVID-19 is an infectious condition uh, which means it can spread directly indirectly from person to another uh, it involves the upper respiratory tract the nose throat airwaves uh, lungs as well uh, we know that it came first from Wuhan in China in December 2019. Uh, how deadly is coronavirus? Uh, we know that it has high infectivity but low mortality. That's something we don't hear. Um, we, I hear journalists say the deadly coronavirus mm -hmm. and that even makes it more scary. So maybe we could lose some of those. Uh, just saying the novel coronavirus will be fine. Uh, so here we are being told that mortality rates range between 2 to 3 percent um, less uh, significantly and less severe than uh, the SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. So the risk of death is only higher in older people uh, above the age of 60 and those who have pre-existing uh, health conditions. So far we've not heard that any child uh, has passed from coronavirus. Um, why is there so much panic? Um, the lack of verified facts and then there are also a lot of rumors. So maybe around this time you want to stay away from some of the fake news.
sick and how sick. So we know that older people are twice as likely to have the serious COVID-19 illness. And uh, most um, coronavirus-led illnesses are generally mild, especially for children and young adults. The question about children is here. Are children also at risk of coronavirus infection? Um, COVID-19 appears to be relatively rare and mild in children. So just over 2% of cases were under 18 years of age. And of these, we had fewer than 3% uh, develop severe or the critical um, uh, case. So how exactly does the coronavirus spread? Uh, we are being told an infected person can spread the infection to a healthy person. So through the eye, nose, and mouth vad droplets produced on coughing or sneezing. So you might just want to stay away from somebody coughing and sneezing around this time. And then close contact with the infection. person uh, contact with uh, contaminated surfaces objects you're talking about handrails door knobs around this time e even even the handle the door handle to your car <laughs> you might want to uh, watch that and then can the novel coronavirus be passed on through food we are told no so there is no such evidence as at yet experience with other coronaviruses like SARS and MERS uh, suggests that people do not get infected through food but of course it's important to make sure that your food is warm or hot if you like it that way uh, can eating chicken or eggs cause coronavirus um, no there is no such evidence as at yet um, the novel coronavirus is not known to spread directly through poultry uh, products uh, do I have coronavirus if I am coughing or sneezing so if suddenly you're coughing or sneezing don't panic uh, you can you can suspect to have coronavirus only if you have symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath. Uh, maybe you've traveled to any of the affected areas or you've had close contact with any such person. Um, the advice is to visit the healthcare facility and then you will be taken care of. Track what your symptoms are. So if you're suspecting that you have it, you track your symptoms. It says that um, they can be almost similar to uh, common cold. Th those are the fever, cough, and shortness of breath, and it may appear two to fourteen days after exposure. So, um, if you have a fever, cold, sore throat, don't panic. Just take good care of yourself. Inhale steam. We are told two to three times a day to clear up the congestion. Stay hydrated. That is drinking water and get adequate rest. Uh, wash your hands frequently to reduce the spread of the virus, especially if you are home or self-quarantining uh, visit a doctor if the condition worsens and then take medicines as advised by the doctor so here we have um, cold versus uh, flu versus coronavirus if you have a sore throat it's more likely a cold than a flu or coronavirus in general so we're looking at the time between catching the virus beginning to show symptoms for a cold, you have one to three days, a flu, one to 14 days. For coronavirus, it will take two to 14 days to pop up. Um, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll get some of the details from our experts here. So I won't spend too much time looking into the details. But the major symptoms, fever, running nose, sore throat, cough, body ache, difficulty, uh, breathing. Should I be tested for coronavirus if I have... Uh, high grade fever cough difficulty breathing or can I get a coronavirus test done just for the sake of satisfaction no um, so the testing of coronavirus will only be done as recommended by doctors if they feel that you have the suspected uh, virus now why can only designated labs test coronavirus um, why can't I get a home sample collection done for coronavirus testing it is because the virus is highly contagious and can only be tested by special labs equipped to handle such uh, contagious uh, pathogens uh, we know that as of now only labs with biosafety level 4 can handle the COVID-19 samples I'm sure our experts will explain can a person infected with coronavirus recover completely and be no more uh, infectious yes uh, people have recovered from the disease we're told that in fact 80% of people have recovered uh, without needing special treatment 
And the next thing is, can coronavirus be treated? Yes. Symptoms uh, based medical care is given. Uh, there's no specific treatment or vaccine available uh, yet, but it can be treated. Can eating garlic prevent um, infection with coronavirus? There is no science based evidence that proves its ability to protect against the virus. So there's no evidence yet. Will warm weather stop the outbreak of COVID 19? Some of us have been saying that the, the weather in Ghana is too hot, and so we are safe. But the experts are saying that heat and warm weather is likely to decrease the spread, likely, and uh, not, to, not to kick it out completely. Uh, how long does the coronavirus survive over surfaces or objects? So it survives between uh, 8 to 10 hours over porous surfaces like paper, untreated wood, cardboard, sponge, fabric, and a little more than this over non-porous surfaces. That's glass, plastics, metals, vanished wood. What type of mask should one wear to protect against the virus? So it's the three-layer disposable surgical masks. They are good enough to contain the virus or the N95 or N99 masks are not mandated, we are told. So we see people with all kinds of uh, masks and handkerchiefs and I even saw somebody with a poly bag yesterday. Um, <laughs> should the coronavirus outbreak uh, concern you about your pets and other animals? To date, uh, we are hearing that no case has been reported of pets and other animals becoming sick from COVID-19. It's still recommended that you wash your hands when you interact with your pets. Major concern, how easily does it spread? So the virus that causes COVID-19 seems to be spreading easily and continually. Community spread is seen only in some affected geographic areas like China, the Republic of Korea, uh, Iran, Italy, Hong Kong, etc. All it takes to defeat coronavirus, we're told three main points. One, protect yourselves. Two, protect your loved ones. Three, protect your community. Protect yourself, you're saying, uh, wash your hands regularly with plenty of soap and water. Abdul, that means that mm. we must have running water. We must have running water. And indeed, uh, those are some of the concerns that our viewers have already sent exactly. in. And we'll be asking our panel about that. Exactly. In the absence of uh, running water, what are the other very effective alternatives? Right. So we're being told that keep an alcohol-based sanitizer ready for times when soap and water is not available, like we have in our studios right now. Uh, do not touch your eyes, mouth, nose with unclean, with unclean hands. Uh, keep your distance of at least one meter from anyone coughing or sneezing. Follow the no-touch greeting with no germs contracted. Um, that is no handshakes, no waving, no hugging for now. Um, protect your loved ones is the next point. It says don't sneeze and cough into your hand. So use a tissue and throw it away immediately or sneeze into the inner side of your elbow. If you don't know what the inner side of your elbow is, that's it. Mm. <laughs> and don't travel or visit crowded places if you are sick. Do wear a mask if you are sick and also if you are taking care of somebody with the symptoms. The third major one, protect your community says uh, if you are feeling unwell uh, seek medical attention if you have a fever cough stay indoors call the numbers that have been provided uh, we'll later on we'll provide those numbers once again and do not share uh, just any message that will create panic um, i see a lot of people sharing messages that are causing a lot of panic so so that's it from the world health organization and the other approved institutions uh, for what we need to know, the No Panic Help Guide. That's right. And uh, the hashtag, remember, is uh, hashtag spread calm, not, not panic. Uh, spread calm, not panic. Fear. Not fear. All yes. right. Spread calm, not fear uh, <laughs> is, is the hashtag. Um, uh, with us in the studio, uh, are very, very uh, professional people. Uh, Honorable Prosper Bani, seated to my immediate uh, right, is a former crisis management official with the United Nations. But um, he also acted in many, many different capacities within the United Nations. And uh, he's also a former chief of staff. He's joined us here. Uh, next to him, uh, Professor Kobna Anan. Of course, uh, Professor is the director at the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And we know the role that the Noguchi uh, Memorial Institute for Medical Research has played uh, so far in this whole fight against 
coronavirus. Uh, of course, uh, the man in the middle of all of this, one of the men in the middle is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Odami. He is uh, the Director of Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Unit at the Ministry of Health. Uh, but also we've been joined by Dr. Kate Nawani. Dr. Nawani is an MP and um, they have already passed legislation to ensure that uh, uh, public gatherings are limited uh, to a large extent, uh, but he's also a medical professional as well, and that's why he is here. Unfortunately, we are yet to be joined by the Deputy Minister for Health. We do pray and hope that you find the time to join us. In fact, this morning we were in touch with him. He had an emergency meeting to attend to, but he assured us that as soon as he's done with that, he will be here. All right, well, uh, let me start the discussion with you again. So we've seen our guide, the No Panic Help Guide. That's what, how it's been couched. And um, one of the things that struck me is that it says the mortality rate is not as bad as we make it appear. In fact, the statistics show that 80% of infected persons have survived. You are on record to have said that we must consider this as a war situation, especially coming from somebody who has worked within war-torn areas. Uh, I panicked when I heard you say that. But this guy is saying, do not panic. This is really not out of hand. Well, then why are we here? <laughs> I mean, really, if there's nothing to worry about, then why are we here? Because on a daily basis, we get our fevers, we get our coughs, we get other illnesses. But we don't have a panel like this discussing fear, panic, calmness. So it means that we are in some form of crisis or another. And I think that this country today must be managed in a crisis mode. Our people are receiving mixed messages, if you like, until you read out this uh, well, uh, WHO uh, information and guidelines. Our people are receiving mixed, money, mixed information. I have been in touch with people out of the urban areas, and they don't seem to know what's going on. Uh, the immediate response is, oh, this illness is a foreign illness. It can never come to our community. If we begin to receive such messages, then it means that we are operating at a certain uh, lower level beyond what is expected. What I'm saying is that every day from two cases, to six cases, to nine cases. This was the trend in China, in the US, in Italy, in Spain, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and it ballooned up. We are at that stage, and we can't be a step behind the curve. We need to take bold and drastic actions to plateau the increase in the numbers. We cannot afford to pretend that it's business as usual. As we speak, we need to develop a certain warlike response to the crisis, as I said earlier. We need to have a command structure. We need to have a place where we can call if we suspect ourselves being in a situation by going to the hospital, yes. But then if you see somebody who is not attending to hospital but has the system, who do you call? We need to get the population to be conscious and aware of what's going on. We need to have verifiable and trusted information to our people. The reason I'm saying this is that we need to build a certain type of confidence in citizens to avoid citizens being in a panic mode, if you call it that way. If you don't have regular, verifiable, trusted information flowing on a regular basis, we have the challenge of people not knowing what's going on. I can tell you that I, as a person, 
I'm scared of the virus from all the information that I've had. I will not want to have a fever today. I will not want to have some cough and sneezing around and being isolated and being quarantined and being my, my contacts being traced. I don't want to be in that situation. And if that is the case, then we cannot pretend that we are not scared. So the attitude of our people must be one of confidence building. We can only reduce those fears if they have the right information, timely information, and appropriate information. Like, for example, all of us must know how many people have been infected today. Two, all of us must know the numbers of contacts these people have made. If it's into the hundreds, because if you are talking about nine now, it means from my own projection, it's nine times hundred. So we have about a thousand people out there who have made contact with infected people. How are we monitoring this tracing? We do not have any luxury of time now to ask people to go and self-quarantine. I think that one of the drastic measures to be done is to follow those people who have made contact and ensure that the surveillance and isolation is effective. Two, we need to know where testing is done. I've, from all what I know is that testing is done in all two locations, possibly. One in Accra and one in Kumasi. Is that enough for a population of 30 million people? No. We need to give confidence to our people that when you because we have people coming in on a daily basis uh, to have only two testing centers. There are others who have even doubted, and this morning the figure has gone up to nine uh, confirmed cases. There are others who say it could be more uh, uh, because we do not have enough testing centers. We have only been able to test these nine people. But probably the number could be more, but except that those affected people haven't been tested because they don't have access to the testing centers. Okay, this is a very important, you know, thing to look at, the testing. Because it's obvious that as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, the ability of any community or country to be able to contain it and eliminate it depends very largely on ability to test. So I agree that we need to expand our testing uh, facilities. In actual fact, at the University of Ghana, Noguchi Memorial for Medical Research, we are specially set up to do certain things. One of the things that we do is that uh, because we are cutting-edge research, we are always ahead and with the global, you know, top-level facilities. Mm -hmm. So whenever there is any situation of a public health emergency like COVID-19, a similar situation occurred in the 1980s, in 1986 during the HIV epidemic, when the HIV became important in Africa. The first case of HIV in Ghana was diagnosed at the Mguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And when we did that, immediately we started perfecting the test at the institute and then transferring technology, building capacity of the health professionals. And then we, do that, we did that and then transferred the ability to test to the Ghana Health Service. And then the institute becomes now more like the certification platform to ensure that things are done to the higher standards. Even in the case of COVID-19, we have already trained some people, some health you know, uh, uh, te technicians and technologists from UHAS. You know. So really, it, it's something that we have to do and we do. It is our part of our practice. But then when it comes to testing today, the Nguchi Memorial for Medical Research of University of Ghana, really, we are set up to do far more expanded testing than we are doing now. Because, for example, the specialized equipment that we use for testing, we have four very good units available to, to, to work with. And each one can do at least 200 samples, you know, in a relaxed mode per day. 
So that brings already to about 800. And so far, the number of samples we have tested is 194 since the you know, uh, outbreak. So really, we can, do, we can absorb the shock once we train and build the capacity to transfer. So we can do the transfer. It's a matter of the national will. Mm. Okay. The other comment I would like to make is that, um, you know, it's very important, the hashtag, spread, you know, calm, not, not fear. fear. I was on Radio uh, Universe the other time with the students of University of Ghana. And I was asked a question that, so if somebody were to get COVID-19 today infected, what is the first, first aid to do? And I said, the first, first aid is do not be afraid. Because if you catch such an infection and you are afraid, it means you have already compromised your immune system. The human body works in a certain integrated manner. And we have to understand that clearly. That is why the most basic definition of what is health is health is physical and psychological well-being. So that's one of the key reasons why WHO is very, you know, interested in saying that do not be afraid, <laughs> don't spread panic. I, I hope you get it. So we need to grasp that. But at the same time, what Prosper is saying is also true. Many human, human beings and human communities, if when they are not afraid, they relax. But if you relax and you don't take this situation as a war situation, then you will be overwhelmed also. So it should be a very clever, intelligent combination of the two. But the bottom line is that do not be afraid. Because if you are afraid, anything can happen to you. Thank you. Well, that, that, that's, that's very deep. Um, uh, Dr. Dami, uh, so we have been hearing about quarantine, and more specifically, self-quarantine. But we have not defined what self-quarantine means, that people should stay at home and still be able to go to the market. If I live alone and I am under self-quarantine, when I'm hungry, what do I do? Do I still have to go out? If somebody has to buy food for me, uh, at what distance will the person be? I mean, what do you mean? How do you operationalize the issue of self-quarantine? Okay, so first of all, let me say thank you. And I feel like thank you to my, the two uh, before me. As one of the things we've made very clear in this, in this battle is that this is a whole of Ghana approach. So the business we are in is not healthcare, it's health. And what do I mean by this? It's all about what's the role of the Ministry of Agriculture in this, what's the role of the Ministry of Interior in this. So this battle has been approached in the whole of government approach. So very quickly, if you look at the National Preparedness Plan, one of the things that we know we have the Inter-Ministerial Coordinating Committee at the level of the presidency. What has been that even the risk communication and health information and all that, the Ministry of Information is playing a lead role. And that's why I see that now twice in a week, Wednesday and Sunday, there's full information disclosure on status where we got all other part parties. So yesterday, if you had watched, we saw the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Transport, everybody coming on board. So every sector is looking at what is my plan to curb this coronavirus approach. So a decision has been taken now on the issue of quarantine and all that borders on national security and interior. So quarantine and all its aspects are areas that national security and defense people are going to have as their baby. Because, and you rightly know, when you send somebody home, how are you even sure that he's not getting out of the house mm. to go to our cellar behind that has that tasty food? So, it's, Nelson is going to take full control of that and even come out with the modalities to educate help. I think what we are getting the Ghanaian public are acknowledge that hitherto, where we saw health as healthcare, where it's about what's happening in the hospitals, that thinking is, is, is not what is being applied. It's about health. And it's even about what you are even sitting here doing in DTV. You are all part of the healthcare crusade. So I want that message to go very close, clear to Ghanaians that every single member of the community is part of the crusade. Like immigration, we have we were just told that we have though we have 15 approved routes, we have all this on approved routes across the length and breadth of this country. It's you and me who live in those communities who know who is coming in and who is going out and how we are let the immigration. So the Ghana Immigration Service also has their own plan on how they are confronting this coronavirus and coming in terms of border control and all those aspects. So this is how 
this coronavirus approach is being tackled. And I am happy you congratulated members of parliament yesterday. Yesterday we had met them. But also clearly, it's the legislation that we need to pass. Because there were certain aspects of public health acts we realized we needed to do some. We're tricking the form to make sure that the measures that have been announced becomes very clear and handy. And they work within the last 72 hours to ensure that this is. So it's about every single person having a clear role to play and under the overall coordination and the command structure of the presidency. So that's how this is being approached, and I wanted it to be on the table. Mm. Okay. Prof, yeah, just to add yes. a little point yes. to what he has said. So the, going to the specifics of the question you asked, so if somebody is alone mm. and the person is to self quarantine, we have to understand as a community that in situations like this, the community works together. And that's a point that Odami is making. Even the ministries are working together. So in the community, we should know ourselves and we should know how to support each other. Because if somebody has gets infected and the person cannot get the basic things like water and food and he's self-quarantined, then he has to take a decision as to whether to stay and starve and die or to go out and get some water or food. Yeah. The community must know that we have to know ourselves and support one another. But take maximum precautions. The precautions are being communicated. I, uh, you know, social distance, hand washing, either with water and soap, um, you know, under running water, or hand sanitizing, do not shake hands. Do not touch your face, especially your eyes, nose, mouth, it is. If you can go by these things, there is no real fear as such if somebody is quarantining. But of course, those who are in charge of uh, the contact tracing and, uh, and, and quarantining will tell you that uh, when somebody is being quarantined, you don't take food or water, for example, directly to the person. You leave it maybe at the door. Then the person picks it, that kind of mm. thing. Uh, Oliver, you, you are from Parliament. Maybe you may also want to tell us, uh, again, in addition to whatever it is that you may want to say, I am particularly so interested in the issue of the quarantine. Yeah. Uh, most of us live in compound houses, exactly. houses that you use one bathroom, one toilet. And so the person could be in his room in the compound house, but still be using the, the, the bathroom. And this person is uh, likely to spit out after bathing, is, you know, blow the nose, and then everything remains in the washroom. I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that is why I think uh, it's an area too that I'm interested in and I've been thinking about it, that if we want to prevent us moving to the next stage, mm. which is the community spread. Mm -hmm. If we don't want to get there, then this aspect of quarantining, we should be able to handle it properly. Mm -hmm. And people, let's remember that people who are quarantined are not sick no, or, or not proven sick. Yeah. Should I, should I say not proven sick yet. Yeah. Some of them have not, I don't know whether they are going to test, but they are not, they are people who have not been proven to be sick. And so they are like me and you, uh, they still need their comfort. Mm. Um, they, they must not be treated like people who are down, who are sick. Of course, if we're quarantined, uh, we, we, we don't want to add any uh, psychosis or any depression or any of the, anything of the sort. So they must leave something that is close to normal life. Of course, those in the high brackets, like probably me and you, or uh, we we can easily car carry out what we call a self quarantine, you know, self quarantine because I can at least get one room to myself in my house, mm -hmm. and I can, uh, you know, I can set up a system where I can get like Prof is saying, somebody has to bring your food, uh, somebody has to get you water. Etc. You, we, we might be able to, to, to be able to arrange middle, that. Middle class quarantine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, exactly. uh, the same question. But what about the ordinary person who is living, let's say, in a compound house, uh, probably having one room? Sometimes others are even sharing rooms with their wife and children. Mm -hmm. How do we go about it? And that is where 
the society has to come in, the community has to come in, the government has to come in and see where to set up these places and how to set it up properly. Say that we don't have people running away when they are quarantined. Okay. I remember, uh, I think I've heard something like that in Tema or some, somewhere, <laughs> where a quarantine person just got annoyed and took his things and uh, said, apparently, apparently, he only stepped out. He stepped but out. He hadn't left. And then the news spread that he, he <laughs> was yeah. there. Like, mm -hmm. There's a community <laughs> vigilance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doc, you want to add something? Yeah. Um, and then I'll, but I'll come yeah. back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, what we want to do, um, we don't know this aspect yes. well. So, yeah. yes. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll, I'll take a break. When I come back, I'll allow you to have a bite on whatever it is you want to talk about. And then, Honorable, you can also add that. Uh, uh, this event, this program is actually supported by Allied Oil. Allied says, why pay more to drive more? At Allied, you pay less to drive more. Allied's Drive More Fuel is currently the lowest on the market. Drive to the nearest Allied Fuel service station and fill up the difference. Drive more, more kilometers at no extra cost. Allied with you all the way. We'll go for a short break. When we return, the discussion will continue. Joseph Fair, a virologist and epidemiologist who's worked on the front lines of the Ebola outbreak in Africa, believes facts may be our best defense against the coronavirus. There's so much misinformation out there, uh, and it's, it's breeding a lot of confusion. Let me ask you this. Is COVID-19, as you call it, is it in the air? If I take a deep breath, did I potentially take a deep breath of the virus? especially not outside. You know, we're sitting in front of nature's greatest disinfectant, which is sunlight, the UV light, and it activates the virus. So around all these people, I'm relatively safe. Absolutely. You need to come into direct contact with it, either by someone coughing or sneezing and those droplets landing on your face, your eyes, nose, or mouth, or you've touched a surface and then you, should, then you yourself touch your face, nose, eyes, or mouth. You're telling me that everything up here is the point of how the infection is gets into my body. It's a natural instinct. Everybody touches their face probably up to 50 to 100 times per day without even realizing that you're touching your face. It's going to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get coronavirus. If you're sticking to that rigid hand washing protocol, if you're using, you, you know, tissues and barriers, etc., you're going to be able to scratch your face, obviously, and not infect yourself every time you do so. And with that in mind, we set out to explore how to best protect ourselves from the virus. So public transit makes a lot of people nervous. I mean, yeah. this car is going to move. Usually there's not a seat. Usually in close proximity. And you're going to hold Again, on. I'll hold it with a tissue. If I don't have a tissue with me, I'll usually do a, an arm hold like this. Uh, yeah. yeah, just keep it, keep my skin from contacting it. But, you know, the, this idea of being six feet away from people, that's not going to happen on a, not on gonna a typical happen bus or train. Right. And that's why it's up to the individual. You know, you've got to cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze with your sleeve, ideally. We know just from studies from San Francisco's metro that a lot of antibacterial resistant pathogens, et cetera, last on these surfaces for a very long time. He doesn't recommend masks, except for sick individuals or trained medical workers. And, you know, I have this desire to put on a mask right now because there's so many people around us. Yeah. The only way we recommend really mask, because there's only a specific type of mask that will protect you against the virus itself, and we should, should tend to reserve those for healthcare workers. Also, if you're not using it with goggles, it's not really going to protect you because you've only blocked two of, the two of the three known routes of transmission. If you are sick and you're coughing, it is a good idea to maybe use a surgical mask yourself as a sick person. That way, when you do cough, if you're not covering, you've at least got a physical barrier between you and those droplets that would come out when you cough or sneeze. Next, we headed to the office. I think it's probably fair to say millions of Americans work in environments not unlike this, sitting, you know, six, seven feet apart. What should we be conscious of? Mostly your own personal hygiene and being careful when you sneeze, et cetera, on others. So obviously wiping down your desk and, and disinfecting your desk several times per day is a good idea to keep your own self healthy. But there is going to be the occasional chance that you sneeze, and that is going to happen sneezing and coughing and during cold and flu season, very normal. So ideally, you'll have tissue or some hand sanitizer next to you. You'll be able to reach quickly grab a tissue, you know, use it to cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze, immediately dispose of that tissue. Don't, don't put it on the desk. Don't put it on the desk. And then hopefully sanitize your hands or go wash your hands. It would be even better. And routinely disinfect your personal workspace, he says. Everything here would be what we call a fomite or a surface that can carry 
a, an infectious virus for up to nine days in the case of coronaviruses. So I sneeze, I wipe my, my nose, I pick up the phone, it's there. Yes, absolutely, because this is really one of the filthiest areas, and including that cell phone in that, that's it's really one of your dirtiest areas. So I wipe down everything, all the keys, etc. I'll take my phone, wipe it down. And the most powerful tool to fight coronavirus is soap. Every surface here is some of your some are your more dirtier areas that you can find anywhere in the world. So everybody that's just used the restroom coming here, this would be an infectious surface. This would be an infectious surface. But this I need would the be water. an infectious surface. I need the soap. Absolutely. So our most powerful tool against fighting COVID-19 as well as any other infectious disease in general, get our soap. Ideally, you'll have hot and cold water. Make it a little warm. And I usually try to emphasize that, you know, just a few seconds is not going to do the job. You don't need to do a surgeon's hand wash, but you need to do it pretty thoroughly. Is it, is it the water, the soap, the friction? What is the soaps have job? a lot of detergents in them that automatically uh, inactivate what we call enveloped virus. COVID-19 is an enveloped virus. So that, uh, that both the friction, sliding it physically off, but also those detergents that break down the virus. Do a good hand rinse. Okay. Now, now so usually I will take, if there's a sink like this, really? my elbows okay. and push it back. Feels a little awkward, but. Yeah, it is. And this is something you have to get used to. Yeah. Walk over, get your towels, wipe your hands. And then I usually take actually a second towel, which I recommend for everyone. And then this is what I use to open the door when I'm leaving the restaurant. Another helpful tip, create a barrier between yourself and surfaces we commonly touch, like elevator buttons. Tissues are not always going to be with you or practical, so sometimes I, I always carry a pen myself. Pen. Touch it with the pen. And speaking of potential transmission points, Fair points out cash is not necessarily king when it comes to the coronavirus. Paper money is one of the filthiest objects that we touched in a day, just because literally millions of people have touched that before you have. And lastly, no more handshakes. Well, listen, a lot of great information. Appreciate it. And we'll, we'll leave it with a, an elbow bump. Sounds good. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking. Well, welcome back. This is uh, GBC's uh, dialogue on uh, coronavirus. Um, our aim is to uh, do the kind of education that will help in curbing the spread of the coronavirus. We have an expert panel here with us. We've been talking about a number of issues. And just before we went on the break, uh, uh, we were highlighting the issue of the quarantine. Dr. Dami, just before we went for the break, you wanted to uh, chip in uh, on, on the issue of quarantine. Uh, Dr. Nawani had just uh, had a bite on that as well. So we think one of the clear things I think we want to also I want to put on the table is that this is also a learning curve. And just like people who have skipped it, they say that you can never prepare for a war till the war really starts. I mean you can do all the preparations, but when the war starts, things might evolve. And we've seen what has happened globally. So as one of the things we want to say is that we are not perfect. We try our best to put in place the right measures of quarantine, but we really count on the communities. Like you say, for the committee members really know a lot, they see a lot, and for us to work hand in hand in this quarantine battle. And like I said, I realize that this area is even a good area for national security and security agents who have a lot of expertise when it comes to the field. We count on the learnings and the, the strategies they have in that area to lead even that battle in the quarantine. So I really also want to encourage that even as we go into this conversation, we also want to really hear from the Ghanaian populace or even on further ideas on how we can really enrich this process. All right. And um, uh, so you, you just joined this discussion. This is uh, GBC's um, uh, attempt to help in uh, curbing the spread of the coronavirus. And Silicon, my colleague here, has more details as to how you can also be a part of the discussion. But you may have realized that our sitting arrangement has changed. We are respecting the physical, um, and Doc was telling us, um, it's uh, physical boundaries? Distance. Uh, physical <laughs> distance. Uh, and so, uh, uh, social distance. Uh, 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 actually, mm. actually, really, I, I thought about that because the more issue that we, we still need to remain social. So mm -hmm. we can remain social on our Facebooks, on our Twitter handles, we can remain social through our Zoom conversations. But the real issue is that we need to keep physical distance apart. Right. So let's remain social, 
but keep the fiscal distance. So we are keeping the fiscal <laughs> distance, uh, as you can see uh, right there. We have kept that distance, and uh, respectfully so. Uh, what, what are the ways that uh, yeah, but of persons course, uh, can Our social interactions here for, for, for you are very important. <laughs> That's why we have um, our WhatsApp line open. So I've seen that some of the messages are already coming in. The number to send the messages to is zero um, five 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 five. So that is a quadruple. Six one zero three four so zero five 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 six one three four uh, zero three four. You can send your WhatsApp messages to that number. Don't call the number. At the appropriate times, when uh, Abdul invites me, I'll read out some of the messages so we can. Yes, but the, but then also when we open the phone lines, uh, there's a line that. Uh, yes, uh, we will open the phone call. lines later on. Also, uh, the number to call in when we open the phone lines is zero three zero. Two seven seven zero two two zero three zero two seven seven zero two two. At the appropriate time, you have the numbers show up on your screen so that you can join the discussions as well. Uh, Honorable Bani, you wanted to add something uh, just before we went for yeah, the day. Uh, on the issue of quarantining uh, persons suspected to have the virus, we should not pretend as we look at that issue that we are in normal times. So again, we are looking at bringing, uh, listening to the views of the community, uh, rely on national security to guide us. That period is over by now. We should have ha a system or a program on how to affect the quarantine situation, both at the upper level environment and the community level we are not we are no longer in ordinary times so we can't pretend that we'll be having to satisfy the comfort of people who we suspect to have the virus and therefore are, are you suggesting that we stigmatize such persons because there's a fear of stigmatization that may lead some people who may have symptoms to hide from the rest of us and not even uh, open up for testing to be well, done. That is there. not the case. We are not going to the uh, to the streets picking up people to quarantine. Anyone who is identified to be quarantined suggests that that person has fallen within the 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 the, the, the category Keep of the people to be quarantined, and that alone suggests that the right thing must be done. If we do not, we will be losing the opportun opportunity for containment of this virus we will be taking things for granted and it will just peel over us and then we we'll get into trouble as we all know these are no longer ordinary times we need to take the dr drastic measures we need to take them now and we need to take them effectively one more thing i think that this whole operation must be led by an independent structure a structure that has all the personnel in the capacity to deliver and not to wait for every two weeks for the minister for information to come and give us the updates we need a structure independent of government that can rule out this effectively of course we can't do this without government institutions and ministries the inter-ministerial inter community will be running but then we need a command structure and if we did that this operation will not last as long as it will last if you don't take the right steps. Prof, yeah, um, I just want to uh, maybe shed more light on some of the few points. Mm. Uh, there was an issue that came up concerning what about if in a compound house uh, the people are sharing a common washroom yes. and uh, potentially that washroom could be contaminated. Mm -hmm. What do we do? This is a very practical question that has to be addressed. And um, not too long ago, the WHO, you know, um, uh, yes, the Secretary General made a statement that we need to make sure that in tackling corona, there is fraternity in, as part of the response, mm -hmm. the community action. You see, we have to be able to bring understand what is community. Community is not just Zongo community and or Madina and therefore that's community. 
community goes down in various new levels. The household itself is a community. The compound house is a community. So the compound house, the members in that community should be able to come together to ask the question, should we have our washroom contaminated? How do we ensure that we don't pick the infection all of us? And that is why also the system is beginning to work together. So we have community health nurses, the HANA Health Service is there, environmental sanitation people are there. You know, in the district, they're all over the place. So we should be able to inform and advise that in this co uh, compound house washroom, this is the kind of disinfectants that is available to us in our community. And this is how we should use it. And the members should understand and adhere to that practice. If they do that, they will be free. Mm. Nobody will pick infection from that watch. Okay. So, and then the other point I want to make is concerning, um, you know, having um, a concerted, non, not governmental as such, but action for uh, a contact tracing. In actual fact, a lot has been done on that already. The Ghana Health Service is working very hard. There is already a whole system for contact tracing, uh, I mean, quarantining and then isolation if there are infections. So really that one, you know, it's been pushed very, very strongly. Because I'm also coming from the University mm. of Ghana, we had a case and there's a whole lot that has happened there. Mm. Thank Interesting. You. Then, so, okay, Doc, I'll come to you before we go to our reporters who are across the country standing by to bring so, us reports. I just wanted to let the Ghanaian public know that they have no reason to be afraid. But, of course, with what I started from, we are still in a learning curve, new things are being brought on board. But we have a whole system for contact tracing as has been alluded by Prof. As I'm talking to you now, we've made contact with about 400 people, and even this morning is still ongoing. So we want to appeal to the Ghanaian public that as we are getting you, let's do the secondary contact, let's do the tertiary contact. It's also important. Mm -hmm. You heard the government measures have been put in place. Anybody flying in now, you go straight into quarantine for 40 years. And then other things have been put into place. But having said this thing, I also want us to be careful that we don't move into stigma. And I would just want to give a quick example here. When I was in HIV, something very interesting I realized. There was a couple. The husband had been positive for a while. He came here, tested he was on medicines. I know as usual, a HIV client, he put the medicines in some multivitamin mm -hmm. bottle mm -hmm. and he was using it. So happened he didn't inform the wife. So the wife at the time also got symptoms. And when the wife saw those bottles and saw the caps, she realized that the capsules looked different from the multivitamin in. She knows mm -hmm. as she was growing up. The husband said, oh, I've been using these tablets for jogging, to enhance my jogging. So the wife apparently also got symptoms, came to a clinic, we gave her, she went through the test, the CD4 count was low, we put it on the tablet. Then when she saw the tablet, she exclaimed. We said, why? I said, I've seen these tablets in my, in my household. So it means even amongst a family, they could not communicate. So she went home that evening and then she came but that one I loved. She said she also put her bottle beside the husband. <laughs> and the husband asked her, why did you get this one? I've also started jogging. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the light answer. But just to say that we should be careful that we don't move this coronavirus and say, look, this one is infected, then there's a stigma. Because that also has huge implications. And let's all remember that it's two things here. Either you are infected or you are affected. If the Chinese nationals have coronavirus, we are affected. If Italy is down, we are affected. If somebody in the North region, Central region has it, we are affected. So whatever, whatever way you look at it, there's affected somewhere. Mm. So we look at it together as a community, as a world community approaching it. Doc, just to allay fears, how are these contacts who have been traced being managed? Yeah, so like you really know, so as we make contact, some of the contacts, even some of the tests, I'm sure Prof is aware, mm. have been sent to Noguchi. And my, my last count, I spoke to Noguchi, all those contacts that were sent were negative. You understand? But still, we are not keeping our house because we are very keen on still monitoring to the 14 days to be sure of what will happen. Because it can be negative today. So you are in touch with these people? We are in touch with these people. Okay. And actually, the whole contact tracing team across all the system agents. And I'm sure my colleague asked that question uh, because, Doc, you know, um, the GJ has also uh, been admonishing journalists as to how to report on these cases. Some, uh, even when the situation was very bad in China, we didn't see faces 
of affected people. The faces will be bled out even where they had to do make reports and so on on TV. Yet in Ghana, people's names mm -hmm. have been put out there in the public, in the media, on the internet and so on. I don't know what your take is on how the media also reports on coronavirus. Uh, <clears throat> well, um, with a profession, we have our ethics. And unless the individual actually are sent to you doing that, and uh, some people are mentioning that, oh, but we have uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Canada mm. coming out to say that I've quarantined myself and that uh, this is what has happened. My wife has gotten the sickness and so I'm, I'm on self-quarantine and I'm working from the house. And so why, can't, why are we hiding in the, the names and the faces of the other people? But that he has assented to it. He has given the permission that this information should come out. And that is the nature of the profession. I mean, you don't get a sick person uh, without uh, uh, the person giving you the authority to bring out the name. Of course, unless the person is misbehaving and becomes a risk to society. In that case, uh, you discuss as a panel and decide what to do. Yeah, but uh, our ethics, the ethics of the profession doesn't permit that. All right. Having said that, you know, I also like to chip in that, you know, for those who cannot carry out self quarantine, they will definitely get to the authorities. And I'm saying that we should use this opportunity. If you go to most of our district hospitals, the place that they call isolation is usually worse than the normal wards. <laughs> the normal wards is usually a place that, you know, a lot of mosquitoes, the ceilings, are, they've not probably used it for a long time. And you know anything that is set aside, if you're not using it, and you're not carrying out maintenance, you know the outcome of the place. So we have to appeal to the government to use this opportunity to refurbish all these isolations that exist in the country. Well, if possible, put up some more, but if not, they should just make sure that you know, the release of money for maintenance to be carried out as soon as is possible. Said so that, in fact, I went, uh, there was a play, I mean, I don't want to call the name. Uh, there was somebody who came from Italy, uh, was showing the signs. I don't know whether he was proven to have the case, but they, they, they were arranging to get a sample taken to Kumasi, you know. And where he was lying, and where, I'm, I'm, I, he just arrived from Italy, so you know, mm -hmm. He was simply not comfortable, you know. Even though they had set up this mosquito net on him, there was no fun, and he was now negotiating to buy a fan to be brought to the room. I mean, it was simply not the mm -hmm. right place. Mm -hmm. So let us use this opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, the, whatever money, whether it's 100 million or whatever money that is coming, let us use part of it, you know. This aspect, the isolations, we should refurbish them and make sure that they become something resembling uh, homes, resembling mm. good words. You know. All right. Thank yes, you very much. Let me yes. just come on quickly. You know, this discussion is still a discussion around things that have yet to be done. And for a response like this, if we all understand that this is within a crisis mode, we are still behind action. We have to move from very beautiful plans, move from boardroom discussions to real action. And in an emergency like this, we need to co-opt as well. Agencies and forces who have the training and capacity to respond to emergencies and um, tragedies and disasters of this nature. If we have those type of people among us today, our discussions will not be like, oh, we have the, somebody is lying in an isolated world which has not been refurbished with mosquito, no fan. It's, it's late. We must try to creatively set up emergency isolating wards. We don't have to have permanent isolating wards right now as a response. So we can have those isolation centers all over the place. If you follow the, the Chinese track, they have dismantled all their emergency hospitals because it was an action 
in response to the crisis. So we must get into that mode of conversation, thinking, and action. Otherwise, tomorrow we'll be here again having a nice conversation about how the numbers have moved from 9 to 25 to 30 to 50. That's where I'm coming from. Okay. All right. So um, the, the whole purpose of uh, this uh, discussion is to uh, test the mood in the country and find out what the concerns of the people in our various communities are. And uh, we currently have uh, Beatrice Senaju. Beatrice Senaju is one of our correspondents in the GBC newsroom. Beatrice is at the Kaneshi Market. Uh, Beatrice, uh, we'll hand over to you at this point in time. What uh, have you found out? Who are you speaking to at the moment, and what are they telling you? Beatrice, take it over. That Ghana recorded her first case of coronavirus, and we are currently here at Kaneshi Market to find out what the concerns of the people are. Over here, I've not seen any um, Veronica bucket here for people to wash their hands and all that. What are the concerns of the people? And I have with me here a lady to talk to me about to talk to me about what her concerns are and what she wants the government and the Ministry of Health to address. How are you doing? Okay, um, if the president should be here, what question would you want to ask him concerning the coronavirus? Well, I would have a series of questions to ask him because my very first question would be that what measures has he put in place in the first place? What measures has he put down to curb the menace? Because there have been so many stories, there have been so many you know, issues pertaining uh, a quarantine, uh, uh, how do I even put it? A quarantine center, yes. So, is the center ready? What has the government actually put in store for the $100 million he has budgeted for? Because Ken Oporiata is saying otherwise. Okay, what the president said, the president said the $100 million is ready. And Ken Oporiata is saying otherwise. So now we don't know. For me, my biggest worry, my biggest question is, have you created a center that will take care of all this bohaha? That's my issue. I have a second person to talk to for the person to brief me on what questions he would want to ask the president or the authorities involved with regards to the coronavirus care in town. Um, good morning. Good morning, madam. How are you doing? Fine, by grace. Hope you are fine too. Okay, if the president should be here right now, what are the questions you want the, uh, the president to address? Okay, for now, all that we have heard is that the cases that we have in the current, uh, country currently are all imported cases. So I want to know that um, since the vaccines are not readily available, or even if there are any, are not readily available in the country, uh, what measures are they putting in place to assist the local pharmaceutical companies to be able to do what they can to at least um, give us um, some uh, preventive um, materials that will help to curb the situation whilst we wait for the vaccines um, internationally to be available. And also, if um, like our local um, um, medical producers like the herbal um, producers, if they also have any idea to bring on board, are they willing or what are the channels through which they can channel their idea to be able to also come out with the uh, medicines they can produce to help in the interim? Thank you so much. Thanks for um, um, airing your views on this. We are very grateful. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I have with me here another lady, and I want her also to tell me what she would want to ask the president or the health authorities with regards to the COVID-19. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Please, your name? I'm Suzanne Daisy. Okay, so should the health minister be here right now? What would you want to ask the health minister with regards to the COVID-19? Uh, I'll ask him the reason why this sickness has come to this Ghana. And also the reason why the, we Ghanaians should stop. Then the students should, I mean, we should be uh, stay in the home at the same time. All the shops should be closed. Uh, what I'll say about this, you know, uh, we need more education about this thing, right? 
Yeah, they have to educate us a lot. I think that will help. Yeah, okay. that's what I can say. Your name. Yeah. These are sampled views of some individuals here at the Kaneshi Market. My name is Beatrice Sanaju. Over to you, studio. Thank you very much, uh, Vishu Sinaju from the Kaneshi Market. Uh, Mutala is, uh, is in the northern region, and I believe Mutala is in Tamale right now. Mutala, what can you tell us uh, what's happening in the... Uh, I hear Mutala is uh, still preparing. So uh, so this is what we have from uh, Kaneshi. Uh, Silicon, what are some of their concerns? Yes, so the concerns is the 100 million ready. Okay. That's the first one. Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, I w that's why we're hoping that the deputy health minister exactly. would be here. He is not here at the moment. Um, but I'd uh, like to come on in finance. Yes. Uh, I think having defined this as an emergency situation and response, we have to build the war chest for it. Notwithstanding what anyone has said, we must have the money to operationalize the action. It may be with partners, it may be our own reserves, it may be uh, the partnership, domestic partnership of businesses, etc., contributing to this effort. But we must have a partnership arrangement to raise the money to, to fight this battle. It is not about waiting where the money is coming from today or tomorrow. If we have indeed declared action on this virus, we can't wait. We can't postpone the availability of money or have a, a, a nice period of discussion on where we have. And here we, we are sitting here talking about uh, quarantine facilities, uh, uh, testing, and other things. And we don't have a war budget to prosecute this operation. Then we have an issue. Again, I to my first point. Is this a crisis that we want to manage and manage effectively and have the necessary results. Right. Yesterday, I think we met uh, the Ministry of uh, Health with the minister himself. And um, they were yet, uh, they were doing a budget. They had a, a smaller budget that uh, they bought some of these PPEs, etc., which I believe that most of it now has been distributed to the districts in small quantities. Actually, uh, I don't quite often, when my doctor is a member of the district committee, so uh, you know, he has a picture of what is at the, at, at the district store. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, some of these protective gowns, it was just one. Nice. Yes, yeah, one for the whole district. Because I was thinking that you know, my hospital is like the second hospital in the town. Mm -hmm. So if, the, this, if it was more than one, then we could have also claimed and taken one or so for, <laughs> 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 for our place. That was what I was you know, trying to let him understand. He said, no, no, it's only one. And so it has to remain at the district hospital. And that is the picture in the whole country. I believe that is the picture because Dunko has got about three or four doctors at the district hospital. So that's a bigger uh, facility. You know, and and, and uh, I think that the picture that the minister was p p uh, painting yesterday is that they are still at the budget level for most mm -hmm. of the things that they want to do. They've started some, yes, training of the staff, etc. Uh, they've bought some of the material. Remember that some money came in earlier, 2.8 million. Then later I heard about 11 million. So some money has come through. But the real chunk of the money is yet to be released. And that, uh, this thing, I still think that like uh, my uh, brother, uh, Honorable Prosper is saying, I think that as a nation, if we are really committed, and if we really identify the situation that we found ourselves as a real emergency situation, then of course we should get the money. Mm -hmm. Or if not all of it at the same time, but at least some bits should be released immediately. Because we're talking of people to be tested. In South Korea, where I understand they, they've done very well with the fight, mm -hmm. they, 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 practically the testing was open to anybody who wanted to test. Mm -hmm. What about us? With a number of only less than 200 being tested, sometimes we complain that 
is we are already overstretched, which means that our reserve in terms of testing is small. That's why less than 200 tests and uh, within the system is overstretched. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Odami. Prof, I'll come to you shortly. Yes, Dr. Rob. Yes. So thank you again, and um, I've been listening carefully. I think let's also not. Uh, I'll just want to touch on operational issues because at, at least that's where I can comment on fully. Is the fact that work is going on, and I think that I want a Ghanaian to know that work is going on. Things are not standing still. As you can see, the public education has improved, and you are seeing more adverts on our news station, radio stations. We are having a public education now on a regular basis. Uh, through the Ministry of Information. As I'm talking about, the contact tracing has commenced and it's ongoing. Like I mentioned, with 400 contacts that have been seen and it's still ongoing. So it's not like students are waiting. All right, then let me chip in this question mm -hmm. about whether the, the, the isolation center or the quarantine center is ready. Is it ready? That question was also asked. Yeah. Yeah, I think having, I know, I've not been there personally, but I know places I've been identified, but I don't want to say something fully that I've not. In my book, but I know places have been identified clearly for quarantine. Mm -hmm. And, and also, senior, also yes. all the hospitals have been to, uh, are designating holding centers. And I'm sure you are aware that in Rage, um, the oh. general hospital have points of treatment where people have been being treated now. Kolebu is almost finalizing a, a place they can use to move, even using their own internally generated funds to move. So we all know that if you're in a crisis mode, and in crisis, like I was saying, in crisis, we don't wait. We, we act. Yes. Okay. okay, Prof. Yes. Yeah. So I want to raise two points. You see, as uh, Prof. Crosspa was saying, it is very important to mobilize resources. And I remember when the Chinese action was in motion. At one stage, one of the key things a Chinese could say was that, you see, we are able to mobilize resources. And to mobilize resources, if you are lucky, your nation has a resources available, reserves, of course that could be used. But if there are no big reserves, doesn't mean that you can't do anything. What about the private enterprise? What about the you know, individuals? What about companies? We have to mobilize resources. I agree with Prosper 100%. It is really a wrong notion for everybody to fold in their hands and wait in that government should produce certain money that perhaps it doesn't have. Of course, that is not to say that government should not produce, because government is supposed to produce an enabling environment, including money. Mm -hmm. So it should be a two-way affair, you know. And then the other comment I want to make is that um, I believe that social media is good, but it introduces certain situations that are not mm -hmm. the best, not desirable. For example, trying to create anything like, what is our hashtag? That was spread calm, mm -hmm. yes, not fear. Not and if you were to go onto social media now and start spreading that, oh, we don't have capacity to test, even now we are overstressed. It's not true at all. And I've tried to explain this on a few occasions. It's not right for people to do that. It is better for us to support one another and to build a system that can be resilient enough to contain this infection and stop it. So it is not true that we are overwhelmed with testing now. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Okay. And we have some reasonable reserves, at least, for the, the time being. But we need to mobilize more. That's what we should all understand. So tell the stakeholders, tell government, that mobilize more in case we need it. Because we can't wait until we need it before, before we try to go and move. And that is Prosper's point. Also. All right. So um, we'll, we'll now go to uh, the regions again. And uh, Mutala Issa, uh, uh, our reporter from the northern region, is standing by in Tamale, he is about to speak to uh, a few of the people there. Mutala, uh, take it over and tell us what's happening in Tamale. What are the views and concerns of the people in Tamale? With the Northern Regional Coordinating Council, where traditional authority and religious leaders gather to deliberate on how to prevent the outbreak of coronavirus in the Northern Region. The good news is that the Tamale Central Mosque, that is the regional chief imam, has suspended congregational prayers across all mosques under the Central Mosque for the next four weeks. Thank you very much for speaking with Ghana Television. Uh, can you share with us what your concerns are? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, these are difficult times, but certainly uh, not a time for panic. And I think that uh, we shouldn't be panicked. 
uh, we should rather be serious and then uh, take care. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, we will be moving to our next person. Uh, okay, so for me, I think uh, the major concern I have is the religious le leaders' response to the directive. I, I just feel that um, deep into our communities or villages, we may have difficulties in enforcing this. And so I think that we all need to enforce it from individual backgrounds, because I think that if individuals individuals do not go to the mosque, they wouldn't pray. Um, so that is what I think that we should do more. What are your concerns, madam, uh, with regards to the outbreak of coronavirus? So, coronavirus, ma, then Karasha, ma, the Sohra, Juapam, Nutuns, but my Zotaman, my bosom, and I'll be him that the Sohra, Juama, Titan, I was on. Can I also the Nasra Dolomazo? And the one I let it in the Sara Dolomazo, I'll go to Cachelle. Don't know my shell and better. All right, thank you very much. And uh, what she's just saying is that uh, these are not normal times. And uh, she is hoping that the various religious leaders and traditional authority will offer prayers and uh, pray to God to intervene to ensure that this uh, disease does not find its way into any part of the northern region. From Tamale, Mutaleisa for Ghana Television. And that's my colleague Mutalaisa uh, speaking to a number of people uh, in Tamale concerning the coronavirus and what their concerns are. Silicon, uh, my co-presenter here, has been noting down some of the concerns. And what are they, Silicon? Well, let, let me backtrack a bit and add a little bit of what we didn't tackle mm. with the Beatrice earlier, Kanishi. There were questions about whether the local pharmaceutical companies could be supported to also start producing uh, the sanitizers uh, as the president charged them to earlier on and then there was also the issue of whether herbal medicine practitioners and producers could also um, be supported to start looking for a cure uh, for us and then with this one there were uh, issues about the enforcing the ban especially uh, the congregational uh, prayers, congregational prayers mm -hmm. and all of that and uh, uh, individual efforts in enforcing the ban. I think most of these ones were suggestions. And okay, not uh, Dr. Dami wants to start uh, this round. Right. So, um, for information and for the information of the viewer public, it's essentially the president has met captains of industry, local pharmaceutical companies, including the Ganesin Bank, you know, the committee, including the Chamber of Pharmacy. The committee has been put in place, but we are alive to the fact that one of the things in outbreaks like this and pandemics like this is dis disruptions in supply chain. Mm. And that's where it's important that our companies of industry are being supported to step up their game. Just to make sure that the supply chains are very fluid. Because if you are not very careful, and the destruction of the supply chain rather may be things that might get people struggling. So that conversation is going. And this is where we also call on the Ghanaian populace. That is where we should rise up to our entrepreneurial abilities and support. So that conversation is going. The committee has been put in place to ramp up that to make sure there are no disruptions in the supply chain at that front. The herbal medicine president have been have been approached. You know the challenge we've had in herbal medicine has always been the Ghanaian thing. You know when you ask someone of the formulations, he thinks by getting it, so he, he'll never tell tell you properly. Mm. So based on that, we've not been able to quantify and really like the way China has been done. But as a country, we've, we've made a lot of progress in herbal medicine. We have a whole directory in the Ministry in charge of traditional medicine. There's a center for plant medicine research that does uh, herbal medicine. In that kind of society, they have. I would say it's better than yesterday because even now hospitals we are trying to integrate traditional medicine into all of those facilities, yeah. which has commenced. We have one in Tishi, a lot of other places. As far as the ministry's plan, we are trying to increase it the more. There's a whole program now in herbal medicine at the KNUST. So that area too, like I said, is better today than yesterday. Right. But of course, it's not at the optimal point. Then I think you we'll asked about the congregational issues. I think the emphasis here, sometimes I think we should also get to the main point. The emphasis here is that we don't want an aggregation of so many people. That for me is the basic logic. How do we ensure we don't have so many people in one place? Not for our benefit, but for the individuals themselves. For the more we start moving into the community spread, like Honorable said, we are now more in important cases. The more the moment we move into community spread, it runs faster. And I think that is what we want to ensure that within the next two to three weeks, we kept it's another we've embarked on serious measures around the airport and ports so where we cut the transmission. Then we can go back to into our other lives. Because the history of pandemics is very clear that there's a major curve 
first one one month if the necessary drastic measures are not put in place then it moves into a, a more fluid spread so that's why you see that most of the time you told that in pandemics we have two bell curves yeah the first bell with a higher peak and the second bell with a shorter peak with a very minute distance in between so all these measures are this is for our interest as a nation to ensure that we don't keep ourselves together and we're able to cut the brick in transmission. Okay. Right. On the back of the local medicine, let me just bring in there's a certain rumor going around that core efforts uh, can boost the immunity or help prevent you from getting uh, the virus. <laughs> Maybe you can address it since you're talking about it. Okay. Yes, okay. Right, cool. Cool. <laughs> All right. Let me let me comment on that. You see uh, I like the point uh, Dr. Adami made that Africa, we have a lot of resources that we have not characterized from. Kua mm -hmm. medicine is um, a medicine that um, has been developed as a traditional herbal medicine. Okay? And when one develops medicine, there are various things to do. One of the first things which is the most important is to ensure that the product is safe. So toxicity and safety assessment are done. Qua medicine, all the toxicity and safety has been done. And then um, qua medicine, people who take it, as far as we hear from anecdotal evidence, like that's some good help, good things for people. Okay. And qua medicine has taken another step forward by being registered by the Food and Drugs Authority and also gotten the necessary clearance from uh, the standards uh, 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 board, you know, uh, authority as well. So what it means is that it is a product that can be used and it is being used as an immune booster. And we know COVID-19, if your immunity is better, you may also withstand better. It has efficacy and it can actually, you know, uh, 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 you know, kill maybe viruses or bacteria or that kind of thing. So that is important. But I think we should move also and look at the products we have, the ones that can do something good for us. We have to move them. We have to as a nation. Right. The other point I want to make is that um, the lady in Tamale made a very, very fine point, uh, almost as a public health official, that look, it all cannot just be done by a certain system somewhere. And she said, look, the most measures have been taken that should be closed. But she believes that everything depends on the individual. Mm. And it is true. It is the individuals. So the individuals, and as we communicate and share information on social media, etc., we have to support one another to do the right thing. And that will do a lot of good to all of us as a nation to be able to contain this infection. The last thing I want to comment at, now, at this time is that we should learn and agree from what the speakers have said so far. That it's a partnership. It is initiative. But let's also remember that it is innovation. So we should learn something from, for example, the University of Ghana. Before the first case of COVID-19 appeared at the University of Ghana, which was an important case, mm. the university had already set up a University of Ghana emergency response team that was putting together so many measures and preparing for should something happen. But I'm not saying that that's not being done nationwide mm. because the Ghana Health Service has been doing similarly. But what I'm saying is that in your house, do something. In your office, take an initiative. You don't wait for a certain big something to come and do it for you. You, you get it. Now, the University of Ghana, the emergency response team working with the entire university uh, management, from the vice chancellor 
pro vice chancellors, registrars, all involved actually. Dean of students, name it what. We have identified facilities at the campus that are suited for quarantine. These are being prepared to quarantine people. And the first facility alone can quarantine as much as 400 people. During the past, we had a wager leprosarium, and after we stopped the leprosarium and people to go there, it became very difficult mm. because, ah, like in a camp, and I don't know, a quarter mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, they become so stigmatized. <laughs> so, we realized yeah. in the area of quarantine to look at the Ghanaian and how our psyche operates, we also need to be very careful on disclosure. I think most of will count on the deep experience of security experts to really advise, and I can see it's bringing a lot of things on board. Yeah. See how we really go around that camp to make it better. Of course, uh, Honorable yeah. Bani also was former but Minister I, of the Interior, so uh, from the security point of view, he knows a lot as well. Yeah, but yes, still, Doc. Dr. Dami, even though um, probably some, some of these areas should be kept a secret, I believe that if you involve these journalists and other places, other people, They go and take nice pictures of uh, the, the, the place. Confidence. You know, it, 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 it will boost our, I mean, that we are prepared, you know, yeah. the preparedness, our level of preparedness. It will, it will let us know that all these areas are there. You know, these nice rooms are there. This nice, uh, uh, this nice building probably is there. It doesn't, we should try to, then we, if people are not, are, Equating coronavirus to leprosy, yeah, that yes. means that <laughs> we, we are not going to have an emergency. We are not going to have our education properly. We are not going to have our education properly. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, coronavirus does not leave anything after it is gone. If it's gone, it goes. It's gone. So, uh, all I have not said is I think I want to just make the kind of public know that <laughs> coronavirus. Like he said, it's not something we should stigmatize in any way. Yeah, yeah. Really, you can even have coronavirus, you recover fully. Yes. Fully, nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. Okay. So the Ghana right. Police should also All right, so we'll now go to the central region. Uh, our correspondent in the central region is Kingsley Nanabuidu. No, we need more information. Kingsley Nanabuidu tells me he has been around uh, the Kotokraba market. Uh, Kingsley, if you're still there, you tell me what's happening there right now and who you have been speaking with. So welcome to the Central Regional Capital, Cape Coast, uh, and uh, to be precise, uh, Kotokraba Market. Uh, you can see activities here seem to have slowed down, and definitely it is as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. We will be talking to the people here for them uh, to also tell us about what they know about it, 
how it has affected them as business people and parents and so on and so forth. And of course, some of the questions they may want to know, they may want to find out from authorities that we have here at the national studios so that they will also be answered and they will know exactly the preparedness and what they need uh, to do. My question is, I think there should be a consensus burden. They should come out, educate those market women and us down here uh, to come to know or to realize the effect of the, the menace. My question is, what is the use of hand sanitizer? And the ABR, so when you have alcohol, you can have to use And how much is it going to protect us? Say, you can have to use every day because you can use it. Because you can use it, you can Are you going to be affected or not? Into the question, or what you have to hand sanitizer, or what you have every day and all day. You used to know, just for me, uh, uh, for some time and all day, be there. Sisiano, or more to Yakuma. Cases are here in a way now, Ghana has seen. And only a problem. Cases are here, Ghana, and ye, a case some way, you know, a Ghana, and ye, and I say a foreigner. Jamie Bazer, me catch them, Penny Fonser. Oh, my father, my mother, too, come with you. Yeah, pa. Sebeya. Yadiano, I knew Bay Chantamina or Mino, a hunter, a crabia, Yurum, yet in your food. If I may have any question to ask, then it will, I'm directing it to the information ministry and that of those at the airport. As to why those people who have come to um, bring this pandemic to town, why were they not quarantined before, uh, even when they got to Ghana? Question, Kakasa Musumu Wazama, and pay from there. Don't you know what's that? One stop of flights. Now, or why not flight if you one out? When you are going to baby, no, the robbers will full plane. The country in the more a one stop of flight, no, Ghana, and you to one you I should be a passing year for Kala. On the Mazi, on the Mazi, on French, and Jay Bianca, and Tia Pede, Oban, or Boy, and what I mean to see him. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, these are the questions and concerns coming from the people in the central region. We were earlier at the Kotokaba market where similar questions and concerns came up. And here too, at the Nkamfua taxi uh, station here too, they have also raised their own concerns and asking our uh, noble panel at the studio certain questions and concerns which need to be answered. So over to you, uh, Mumin. All right, thank you very much, Kingsley Nanabuedu from the Central Region. Um, uh, he has been speaking to some people at the Kotokraba market. Uh, Selikem, you were noting down so the I concerns. So I run through all of them. Uh, what is the consensus uh, in educating market women, especially about handling themselves in the markets? How effective are hand sanitizers? Should it be used every day, every time, or when you use it at a point, you can stop? Um, the cases and the profiles of those who have the disease, who are they? Are they Ghanaians? Are they foreigners? People want to know. Um, why were the those who came in with the disease why were they not stopped from entering the country and then transportation services education as to how people should conduct themselves in trotro uh, buses wear and gloves. wear gloves mm. all these these things yeah okay so doc uh, let's start with you yeah so thank you so much and i can agree with the concerns of the Ghanaian public and just to let the Ghanaian public know that on the 16th of march a letter came from the ministry of local government and rural development and i just want to read some right. parts of it they declared that we should set up a public health emergency committee, which has been now been operationalized. And this committee will be made of the district chief executives, the district security committees, the municipal executive, the district director of health, the district director of education, district information officer, district NADMO coordinator, district environmental health officer, and the district committee water and sanitation agency. And they will collaborate with our district health management teams, the National Commission on Civic Education, the Department of Social Welfare and Community Development and our traditional authorities. One of their key remits, working with the health services, to set up public sensitization teams under the overall guidance of the Public Health Emergency Committee to embark on continuous public education. Currently, as I'm speaking to you now, all the original directories have been trained in what we call on surveillance methods they need to do, training of trainers that they should embark upon, all the districts are led 
and regional rap rapid response teams are working. We even have what we call case management teams across the country who are looking at case management and abiding by the case definition, knowing how we are isolated. So all these teams are operational and they are in the phone. And I think he has the question about transportation. Yes. Yesterday, if you are listening to the media press, realize that even the briefing, the Ministry of Trans Transport, the Ministry of Transport himself, give a briefing on what they are doing in the transport sector in terms of the GPLT people and the nurses. Having said this, clearly, I can see that we are not at, at our destination yet. Mm -hmm. We still have some more to do and that we need to hasten moving forward. In terms of the categories of people who have been infected, it's a mix of Ghanaians and, and foreigners. But the interesting thing is that all these are imported, and I want to emphasize here, these are not cases that were transmitted within their communities. These were people who came from the diaspora into the country. So that's the nature of the cases that we have now. And so mm -hmm. the one of the questions was, can't we close down the airports and stop people from coming in altogether? Yes. Um, so I think one of the in, in emergencies, and like we all know, you scale up the measures. And if, if you can see, within the last two weeks, measures have been scaled up. Before then, we didn't even have this issue where people could not come from countries with more than 200 cases. Now we have that in place. Mm -hmm. And if you have been following the news, some people have been returned back. Mm -hmm. okay, airlines have been gone back. So really, on the ground, some of these measures are already being operationalized. But of course, I'm sure depending on how they sing, and that's why in His Excellency's speech, it was very clear that these things will be reviewed Continue, <coughs> depending on expert advice. Yeah, I think, uh, let us just be clear on this issue. Um, Ghanaians, anywhere, everywhere, or wherever you are located, mm -hmm. you have a right to come home. It's your human right. Even, even if you have the disease, and you, you still fly and land in Ghana, and at the airport, we test you, and we know we we, we, we get you to have the, the the sickness. We can prevent you from entering once you are holding the Ghanaian passport. If your own country is rejecting you, then which country will accept yeah, you? Exactly. Mm. The other aspect is that Ghanaians, I'm non Ghanaians with uh, permanent resident permit. If you've got a resident permit cannot also be turned away. That is, I think, that one is international law. Or, you know. So, the people who landed, I don't know the last two, uh, uh, are they also from abroad? Mm -hmm. they, they, yes. Even if at the airport we tested them and they were positive, what we could have done is probably at that point to refer them for the treatment or to isolation for treatment. But, Possibly at that point when they came, it was at the latent stage. And at the latent stage, even your temperature can be normal. I remember that at the airport, we were able to take temperature and ask you some other few questions. So that if you don't have the symptoms, your temperature is normal. We say that the sickness is at what? The latent stage. Mm -hmm. A stage that we cannot. Uh, detect that mm. you have it or not. Even at that point, even if they carry out a test, it's possible that you'll be negative. Right. Yes. Before, after some four, five, or six days, or up to 10 or 14 days, that is when you turn positive, and they will see that we have confirmed that you have what? The sickness. So, um, we need to understand that, yes, uh, we could, what we could have Possibly if certain instructions had come earlier, possibly the people who are being quarantined or the contact people could have been less because we have probably told uh, those people that why don't you self-quarantine yourself if you are coming from, let's say, a country such as Italy mm. with so many cases. Then the person, possibly the, the contact people could have been less. Otherwise, uh, we can't prevent this number. Okay. Yeah, from entering the country. And yeah, and yeah from, uh, I, I still think that the operations are still normal. We don't, as from all the conversations we had, we don't feel the urgency for action from our 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 people. 
they are still wondering where are these people coming from? Sanitizers, are they useful? Uh, one of them said we should pray. I mean, in, 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 in emergency situations or response to emergencies, we don't have room for, for non-important things. And I can understand that there are a lot of consultations and preparations going on and actions being taken okay. at very low levels. But my sense is that these actions and consultations and meetings are normal processes that goes on in ministries when addressing uh, uh, issues. But when you have a surge of activities, then you need to discontinue your normal practices and have a surge operation to respond to a specific emergency issue. And that's where I'm coming from. Even as we recognize that these actions should have taken place immediately we had the first two cases and, and raise the urgency of our testing, isolation, uh, uh, what do you call it? treatment and information uh, dissemination. We need to just focus on those things. And I think that the technical community must up its game at this time. We spoke about the resource-based challenge. We need to quickly increase our partnership to build up resources. Again, the partnership should not only be of resources. I think that the media, we've, we've mentioned the media a couple of times here. If they are not informed on a regular basis, our communities are in crisis. All communication institutions and organizations must begin to define ways and means of communicating these to our people through various uh, media. If you take the uh, what do you call it, the phones, for example, MTN must be regularly giving us information about where we stand on this commission because most of our farmers, our tradesmen, all carry phones. These are emergency times which needs emergency actions. And I think that that kind of feeling must be one that we have to guide us as we move along. I know that when Ghanaians get the information and their tax they'll be able to deliver. I have no doubt about it. But is the is the is the transformation of the moment from being normal times to one that is responding to a, a global crisis that has national implications. It is a global crisis, yet we are part of the global system. And if we don't act, we will have their consequences in our economy and our All lifestyles. Right. Prof, Thank before you. we move to, let me bring Prof in, Doc, and I'll come to you before we go to uh, Sunyai. Uh, Prof, uh, do you have any responses to some mm. of the concerns that were raised? Yeah, I think I should comment about, um, a little bit more about why we were not stopping people from coming to Ghana. Um, maybe we have to let the general public know that right from beginning, the Ghana Ports Authority had put in place measures to screen people who were coming to Ghana. So at least using the, the, the you know, uh, temperature sensors, check, taking the body temperature, and also doing basic, you know, hygiene at the airport, sanitizing, taking some critical information. In the early days when it was almost exclusively in China. So which countries you are coming from and then the things starting to spread. So all those information help to contain. But as, said, my, as my colleagues have said, it's a matter of a, it's a re relativity thing. You can't just say that. Maybe as we learn uh, as a nation and maybe in the near future, maybe such an epidemic may come and we'll close the country. But it's not the best response to close countries. After all, didn't Ebola come and it was in Liberia, mm -hmm. it was in uh, Sierra Leone. Liberia and Ghana are so close. We had so much relationship. We never stop any Liberian from coming to Ghana, but we never had Ebola. So it's a, there, there are so many issues, uh, I mean, things to it. So things are done and it's escalated from point to point. But then Prosper is making a point which we should look at somehow because we have to have a feeling 
that we are responding as a people, as a community. When that feeling is missing, it's not good. So I think there we should all come to the table and ask how do we get a feel that we are in doing something. We need that psychologically. Okay, the other comment I want to make is about the hand sanitizers. Somebody is asking a community-based question, and perhaps it's also coming from the point of view of cost. Yeah. Now this thing is expensive for me as an individual. You said I should use it. Now if I start using it, before you come and tell me tomorrow that once you have started, you can never stop. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very genuine question. So I want to comment on it that uh, the hand sanitizers, if you use it, of course, it will protect you hygienically. Uh, but then you can stop anytime you want to stop. But of course, you wouldn't like to stop when COVID has not been stopped, <laughs> you know. And even when COVID is stopped, you may want to continue because it will still protect you from other infections, like right. typhoid and name it what and what. Okay. Doc, come in briefly, then we'll go to uh, Sunyai. Yeah, so uh, just to say that, uh, of course, like I, ke I keep on saying that we will not say that we are at the optimal point. But one good thing we can tell that things are being escalated. As I can talk to you now, we have what we call the emergency operations center. It's been activated. The emergency operations center at the point was headed by the director of public health, the general health service. Now as I'm speaking to you now, the Honourable Minister of Health takes control over the emergency operations center. Who? The Honourable um, Minister of Yes, takes over there. But it's even being uh, moved, moved again. Senior leadership is even being moved again. Those meetings have all been activated. So just for the general public to know that systems have been, and of course, when it comes to this system, Ministry of Health will work in close contact with the World of Organization, okay. look at it. So they are also on board in all our conversations to ensure that all that we are doing is also in best practice. So, because Ghana is also in the Committee of Nations, so we should ensure that we are working according to best practice standards, which we are also doing, and, and constant touch on that. The other thing is that there's also one yeah. good opportunity to um, brief the Ghanaian problem. There's a whole dedicated website now, where in real time, Facts are being put in the Ghana Health Service dot org slash COVID. So, which was also said the last time. So, please, let's be going on to those websites. But I will also to appeal that through this program, also, we are also learning, getting good feedback mm. for the Ghanaian public. And All I right. think it should also be, we want to encourage this so we can also up our game. Okay. Um, and the program is supported by Allied Oil. Allied Oil says when you use their fuel, you drive more for less. Um, we'll now go over to my colleague in uh, Sunyai, Frida Aban. Frida Aban is standing by now uh, to speak to us. Frida, uh, what can you tell us about what the people of Sunyai are saying in respect of uh, the coronavirus? We are joining you in this discussion from the Abno Regional Capital, Sunyai, and we have a few of the citizens here who have concerns to share about um, the outbreak and other measures put in place to ensure that everybody is safe from COVID-19. And so we have one of them here. Hello, sir. Hello. What do you know about COVID-19 and do you have any concerns to share? Um, we are avoiding large gatherings. So what are they supposed to be doing while they are at home? Much that is a, a concerned citizen sharing his thoughts on the outbreak. And we have another one here. Hello, sir. Hello. We are joining the uh, panelists at the studio. And so what are your concerns? Uh, my concern is that this coronavirus uh, outbreak is very serious and severe one that the government has to take time and have a look at it. Not done yet. We have one more citizen here who's also going to share who is also going to share his thoughts on the outbreak of the virus and measures being put in place to ensure that we are safe. Hello, sir, you are welcome to GBC. Let's hear you. Thank you. Thank you. What we virus. have to do is as like the government already said, we shouldn't be crowded. Whether the people are so crowded, we shouldn't be crowded. That is what I'm urging the government now that is short in market. I come around all the time, couldn't get some to buy. Okay, thank you very much. He's touched on some measures he is putting in place as um, a transport owner. And then he's also touched on what the government has to do to make sure that people have access to the tools that is going to protect us from the virus. 
And so studios, thank you very much for having us. This is the Blue Regional Capital Sunyai. Let the debate begin. Let the discussion go on. We will join you again when you need us. Frida, we'll be getting back to you subsequently uh, when we need more information from Sunyai. Um, uh, my colleague Rebecca Wa is right here in Accra, but she is currently positioned at the Malata market. Um, just to also find out from persons trading around those areas uh, what they know about the coronavirus and if they have any questions for our panel here. Uh, Rebecca, if you can hear me, take it from there. A month, the whole world went quiet, but for one reason a global threat that has taken the world by surprise. Coronavirus, it is called, and it is killing businesses and killing people as well the world over. And so recently, Ghana recorded uh, some few cases, about six of them, and the government of Ghana had to come out to issue precautionary measures to curtail the spread of this virus. Today, we are situated at the Malata market, where we'll be finding out from the market women what measures they are putting in place to also prevent the spread, and whether they have other concerns and questions for technocrats and the government of Ghana. Yeah, very impressive. I can suffer Malata market. The artist say Arabia by a friend of Korean virus. By a coin so far so by the Yamin Kwan in him. And at the same time, a whole answer near a president, a free or buy, or buy and so I did chin and it is a Yarenaba. And see, but same business a more bang and a bino or better media buying. See, I saw my penny so near being found on farm buying. It's as a kitchen collar, see a strano. Mr. Fit Mustau, known as Kapu. A unit committee member in my area. Um, my question is: Is it the, the gloves? Is it safe? Because you know, sometimes you might put the gloves, and uh, you've been touching something. And at this time, at this, at the time, yeah, maybe at the same time, you are also selling. Maybe uh, you scratch your, your face with it. You don't know whether the virus is in the gloves. So I uh, end up. Secondly, too, the gloves is not available. You can't find the gloves even to buy. Or, and the government have to do something about that. Because when something this way is in the country, I think government have to provide the gloves, provide uh, nose masks. Government have to do something. But if it's like business, people are doing it with business, especially their hand sanitizer. It's business now. Because something now you can buy three cities, now it's ten cities. That's not safe. And somebody cannot even buy 10 cities. So government have to do a lot. Because I work at um, Malata Clinic, CAC, Community Health Committee. All these things, we have to be even like sanitized. They have to even call us and give us some education about all these things so that we can go to the people. Because I'm a community person. But all these things is mute. And the government will say something different. And the, the uh, clinic will say something different. Then, uh, yeah, you're able to media protect your home for coronavirus. Eh? Right, so there you have it. Um, I have been interacting at the Malata market with some market women who are very much concerned about this novel virus known as coronavirus. They have been posing very legitimate concerns to the government of Ghana and also to health experts and technocrats in the field to find answers to those ones. So, my name is Rebecca Iwa from here at the Malata market. I hand over to you in the studios. And so we had uh, Frida Aban from Sunyain, and that, uh, of course, was Rebecca a while, a while ago, uh, bringing us concerns from both Sunyain and the Malata market right here in Accra. Telecom, so you uh, right. have the details? Right. So a few of them were concerned about what they can do to protect themselves against the virus. I mean, regardless of all the education that mm -hmm. is going on, people are still asking what, what can they do, how do they protect their families, their children, and people are concerned about that. Then... Well, they also want to know how seriously government is taking this. What's, what's the serious, seriousness being attached to addressing this? So, like you said earlier, they want to have a feel of that, that um, something is actually being done. Then somebody asked, what do we do while at home? Everybody is at home. You say we shouldn't go out and, to gatherings. What do we do while at home? And then the question about the gloves, how safe are the gloves? And then... Also, what is being done, especially for those in uh, community health facilities in terms of education, provision of face masks and gloves for them as well. So we'll leave this open. Um, yeah, let me yeah. take it from uh, two, I'll take two of the issues. Uh, the first one is what do we do at home? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the, the change in the society also brings about change in a lot of practices. I mean, culturally, we have a problem. I mean, any time you meet people, the first move is to shake hands. If you meet uh, close people, you hug. Uh, at, uh, along the way, in groups, you tap, you hold hands. This is what I know, coming from a, a typical Ghanaian community I grew up with. Now it's something you cannot do. We cannot attend to our regular and sometimes spiritual cultural gatherings have been suspended. Weddings have been suspended. Things about emotions and love activities that people attend every weekend have been suspended. Outdoorings, the, the way we welcome our new babies have been suspended. We can't have that fanfare around it has been suspended. Funerals, the way we send our departed souls back to where to our ancestors has been suspended. There is going to be a cultural shock. And it's not going to be evident right now, but in the next couple of weeks, you'll see the psychological effect on our people. We need to find a way to manage that. And that is the sense of bringing people along. The education must be intensified. And when we are talking about education, there are two types of information dissemination. There's one that goes directly to educate our people, and the other one is to provide information. This information must be trusted information, must be variable, variable information, uh, what Very verifiable, verifiable information. One that you can, you can have confidence in. It raises the confidence of the people about what we are doing. And therefore, if you give them additional direction, they will be able to respond to it. But if, we, if they don't receive that, we will have this type of questions every day from our communities. Do we use hand sanitizers once? What about the gloves? You can see that we have a huge gap in communi communicating the issues as we stand out to our people. We have to mobilize our people along this track. Otherwise, we will be saying, we will be behind the curve. We will be behind the curve. All right. Uh, well, Prof, yes. Yeah. So let me take uh, the first question. You said we shouldn't go out and we are at home. Mm -hmm. And when we are at home, what do we do? I think it should be clear that when you are at home, the first thing you do is to join the campaign. What I mean by that is not to go somewhere per se, but begin to do the things that prevent the spread. So the prevention. And what are the pre preventive things that you are supposed to do? You are at home. Keep that social distance or physical distance we talked about. Like we are sitting here, if I stretch my hand one meter, I can't touch my brother, you know? <laughs> so always be at a distance from other people. If somebody develops the cold, that person you increase the distance to two meters so that you don't catch the infection and create a problem for everybody. And you help other people to remember. That's a, those are some of the things you are supposed to do when you are at home. Remind people that some, this one has a cold, so the distance is bigger. Apart from that, you are supposed to be, don't, don't shake hands. So be a part of the process. Let the people around you remember that you don't shake hands. You are not patting people's back and what. Remember that you have to wash hands frequently. So all those things are things you are supposed to be doing. And these are things also that will prevent, help us to contain, prevent the infection and contain it. Honorable Bani so, talks about the cultural shock. Um, culturally, you, you extend the hand to mm -hmm. shake somebody is uh, regarded as rude yes. when you decline to shake the person back. Yeah. Uh, we must begin also to reorient uh, our people that it's no longer the case that it's uh, rude, but that is what has become practicable. Exactly. Right. All right. And it's interesting that mm. when you get home as a parent from work or the market or anywhere, you meet your children, they rush to come and hug you. You haven't washed your hands yet, you haven't sanitized yet, 
So these are all things that. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. It's, it's right. Okay, Doc. Yes. Yeah, so I think I would just want to make this comment. That in an epidemic, two things determine the speed of an epidemic. First is how many contacts the person who has it is able to reach out to other people. What is the as the reproduction number? Mm. And then how quick it is transmitted from one person to the other, what we call a serial number. Just in the last 72 hours, some research has been done by researchers at the University of Texas has shown that in the case of Ebola, the serial number is a matter of weeks. But in the case of Corona, it's a matter of days, three to four days. So it tells you clearly that, and the fact is that even people who are not showing symptoms, mm -hmm. which in medical terms is called asymptomatic, mm. can even transmit from one person to another. So that's how tricky the coronavirus is, and that's why we are hampering on maximum preventive measures. Regular washing of hands, sanitizer use as backup. I say the sanitizer use as backup. Mm. Because the regular washing of hands, detailed or like as if you are going to operate on a patient. Finger by finger, in between, and making sure that you are cleaning them well. Making sure that we keep the, the distance apart. If you are coughing, the basic etiquette. The truth is that most of this basic etiquette is part and parcel of the basic things we should have been doing, by which we, I'll say, oversight. With that. Having said this, this also touched on a bit of our culture, and I think some of the people have alluded to it. And I'm happy that within the last 48 hours, the Quill Traditional Council came up with a strong wedding that they banned this year's Easter celebrations. Mm. For me, it was a landmark statement because, first of all, they responded to the assistance of the president mm. by letting people know that, look, we have the same culture with you. Mm -hmm. We are telling you that we are doing a cultural shift, mm. which is a landmark statement because then it's appealing to that congregant that we're doing a cultural shift because of the change in circumstances. Sometimes I say jokingly that cultures evolve. I'm sure once upon a time we were not wearing even clothing. It is all. And we started taking <laughs> drinks and <laughs> European schnapps when we're going to get married. You understand? It's all evolved. So we are at another stage. And yeah. we should evolve. Doc? Okay. Yeah. Uh, somebody was saying that uh, they have to wear gloves. Yes, was. Uh, are the gloves safe? How safe? Yeah, how safe is it to wear the gloves, etc.? And. Um, <laughs> uh, I look at it, well, with a wearing of gloves, um, I don't know whether the, the, the gloves can, uh, to what extent the gloves can protect you. Because we are saying that when this thing touches even your bare arms, and you use your bare arms to touch your face, your face um, you can get infected. And so let's use the sanitizers to always wash our bare hands. Now, are we saying that if coronavirus should touch your gloves and you use it to touch your face or your nose or your mouth, it can protect you? No, hmm. it cannot. And um, science has proved that involuntarily, we once upon a time, once in, a, in some minutes, within 10, 15 or 20 minutes, we touch our face. Yeah. So whether you are wearing a glass or not, it appears that it will not protect you as the individual from coronavirus mm. because if you soil your, your, your gloves, I, be, I even have the belief that they might be able to stick to the gloves better than even your bare pants. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but and to add to what you're saying, beyond that, even in the process of taking off the gloves, assuming that you are conscious enough not to touch your face, yes. or any, but in the you take off one, yes. and then the other hand is left there, yes. and you have you, to then, you, you, then uh, automatically <laughs> you are you you yourself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, this idea of wearing gloves, uh, people are wearing gloves, etc. We should look at it properly. I, I, I think I'm um, just, just give a scenario, but we should look at it properly and probably inform our people that no, wearing of gloves is not better than uh, the, bare arm, uh, the bare palms where you use your sanitizer uh, within 15, 20 yeah, minutes okay. to, to yeah. clean your arms. All right. no, it's but not superior you know to it. The, the mm. toll booth operators are wearing gloves. Mm. And they are taking money from everybody and giving out change. You know, <laughs> so, so if there was an infection on the glass, <laughs> exactly. they're very to everybody. I, I went through it yesterday and the gloves were dirty. So uh, I practically took the 
um, the receipt like that because <laughs> I. <laughs> but still, if there was an infection, it should be on the receipt. Yeah. Yeah. God, God forbid. So, <laughs> let's look at it properly. Mm. It's not playing any role. Mm. It's not playing any role. I mean, if it's not worsening the situation, then it's only uh, making things. Uh, uh, it's not making anything better. Mm. But I believe that it's even probably worsening the situation. Right. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to um, the which region is that? Sambala Yama is in the Upper East region. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Nawani will be interested in this one. Samala <laughs> uh, so, Yama is uh, standing by in the Upper East region. I, I'm, I'm yet to pick exactly where in the Upper East region Samuel is at the moment, but Samuel, if you can hear me, you take it up from there and tell us what the Upper East region, the people there are saying uh, uh, and what their concerns are uh, so that our panel can respond. I contribute to the current program that is on uh, going. Uh, the Upper East region uh, is a border region. We have five approved borders in the region. These uh, borders include the Pumako border, the Kulugugu border, the Namo border, the Moknore border, and that of the uh, Paga border. And all these approved borders, we have only one border, that is the Paga border that has a holding a unit. The rest don't have, even when you move to Pumako, they don't even have a port health officer there. A disease control officer explained that rule which is very, very, very um, serious. And then it is not helping uh, immigrants and then the health workers there uh, as well. Um, logistics across all the borders is very, very uh, limited. They don't have uh, the materials, the needed materials uh, to work with. Um, the residents, particularly those uh, living along the borders of the region, are really expressed worry and concern about this um, issue because they have the hope or they feel that uh, if anybody gets into contact with this outbreak of the uh, uh, coronavirus which has been code named as the COVID-19 uh, it will spread fast because of the sporous natures of our borders. I have some of the residents here uh, to speak to us about this uh, issue. Uh, tell me your name and then uh, what are some of your concerns uh, with regards to the preventive measures that have been put in place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Akologo Tijani and um, with this COVID-19 has brought a whole lot of uh, um, a whole lot of uh, panic to the peoples within this Kakme area, Pusuga to be precise. But uh, the directive from health ministry is saying that we should always wash our hand with running water. But here be the case. We the good peoples of Pusuga here, we don't even have proper water, we don't have boreholes, we don't have dams, our dams has dried up, we don't have water to even wash our hands. So I don't know what will happen. I'm appealing on NGOs and um, stakeholders, if they can help us with water and a whole lot of things, that one, it will help us to combat this uh, pandemic that we are all challenging for now. What were some of your concerns too? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Akwanya Yakubo. I'm also a resident in Pusiga here. Uh, I have seen that uh, the borders within our catchment area here, more precisely uh, Pulmakum borders like this, there is nothing like, we heard that uh, there's supposed to be health workers there checking on people who be coming, who be crossing from Togo to Pusiga or Togo to the region. But there is no any health worker around that side to check whether those who are crossing in they are healthy or not. Uh, apart from the Pulmakum border, we also have a border gets closer here, Pusiga, uh, uh, the Kulugungu border. Uh, I think that place too is this, that place that they are doing quite well, quite better. But the Pulmakum border, so we are afraid. We are we are we are afraid actually. So we want to plead on government to come to our aid to actually bring health workers to come and then uh, support to check on. Because people are crossing in day and out. Every day people are crossing from Burkina, from Togo, and they are coming in. So we don't know who is a, 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 a listen. We don't know the one who is a victim. So all of us, we are at risk. So we are pleading on the government to come to our aid so that to, together we will fight this kind of uh, disease. 
coronavirus. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also have another resident here uh, to also um, add his um, stake on this particular uh, issue. Tell me your name and then what do you have to say about this um, issue that we have at hand? Mm, thank you so much that question that you are asking me. My name is Asidu Asana Bonava. I'm a businessman for this community here. I'm a Roman always. So since it started headed Corona virus, the something that is coming white and they're protecting those the other bodies. So since I came my hometown, I didn't see any protectors. Because if you see two old ladies, we close up here you're having two bodies. Uh, Togo and Burkina. All local bunga that if you read that I put some water that is my city be checking people. But Kognogo here is closer with Burkina Faso. We doesn't see any difference. So we're crying for government that they should help us. So we're protected about this sickness. If not, then it's very serious. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, you've heard the residents in the Upper East region uh, raising some concerns about the um, various borders, the porous nature of their borders. And again, too, apart from these five approved borders, there are a lot of unapproved borders uh, in the region, particularly you move to Pulmaku for instance there are a lot of unapproved routes there even according to the officials there uh, they told us that they have a lot of unapproved rules there that they are battling with and they are calling on uh, the government, players in the health sector and all the security agencies to at a matter of agency come to their aid. And I believe strongly that uh, your panelists are listening to their concerns raised. They will find a lasting solution to it. Thank you very much for the, the opportunity. And that was Samuel Ayama from the Upper East region. Pusiga is where he uh, just sent us that report from, uh, but you also had from the <coughs> residents um, and their main concerns, especially those living around the, the, the border areas. Um, we'll go to the Ashanti region, and that will be the final region uh, that will be uh, taking concerns of the people from uh, for now. Uh, Nicholas Oseusu is uh, my colleague who represents us in the Ashanti region. He has been speaking to a number of people there. Nicholas, if you can hear me, take it up from there. We are located specifically at the uh, central post office here in Kumase, a commercial area of the regional capital. And we are going to sample the views of people who are prepared to tell us their views about the disease that is causing so much havoc to society. And so we are ready to speak to some of these people. Sir, tell us your name and what do you do here? My name is Nana Wan. Yeah, I'm a herbitist. We are here to discuss with you and to find out from you if you know anything about the disease that is causing so much havoc and trauma in the world. What is it? Yeah, we know about the disease and we've heard and we've seen the disease, you know, I mean, catching people and stuff. And, and you know, as you can see, we are protecting ourselves with our hand sanitizer and our nose guard and, you know, and it's real. The sickness is very real. How prepared are you to protect yourself against it? Oh, okay. Um, first, I read, I read about um, the um, publication from the Ghana Health Service and uh, the precautionary measures like washing your hands frequently, uh, using a sanitizer, keeping a distance when dealing with people. Yeah, that's, I think that's the basic uh, precautionary measures I have taken personally. Okay, for the government aspect of the, dealing with the virus, I'm not satisfied because uh, the day the president was talking, he, I heard him saying that they have put in aside hundred million dollar that they will be using to cure the or to help us cure the disease, the virus. And as it stands now, we don't have any isolation centers. We don't, we don't have like anything to prove that they are working. Whilst the disease is also, since it started, it was two, now it's seven. So it means it's, it keeps on spreading, like keep on going up. Why is it supposed to reduce? So what are they doing so that it, it will reduce? Then the panic going around the country, in fact, commercial like this, if, when you're in a car and somebody coughs, there's a panic. And I think they should put some isolation centers. Even the ambulance can be, be put in at adventurous places so that people can go in for their tests and stuff. Abai, I didn't say I was a sort of crying yako. A year so I attack on you yako. Sir, and to say what would you say? I mean, when you say I did a bad boy, 
because me me who ni say nya Ghana nko a na sorry ya tutum e na yi ni sanyo ma sa gathering no se no na e be ma ade na spread ya na be say ya i didn't think i see cause wa na ye it the government ya e na ss e di so i would want to find out from uh, a few other women traders who are here with us so we wrap up uh, with them to know what uh, the situation is uh, madam yeah, but see, I know things come up. But now, we are reminding you now, because I'm from Ghana Television. But so, you're from where? I'm from Mesta. Yo, but you're not here today. I'm from Tampa, boy. Yo, you see, I'm here to have a salmon sandwich. What's in what's in your friend's? I'm from a friend who calls me Avaro. Yo, at the end, I want to have fun. Now, here, I want to see some. Me too. What from so? I don't know, because I'm going to go to seven and get a little bit of 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 a little bit Okay, um, but Sandikem, quickly, let's take the concerns. Uh, we have just about 10 minutes to wrap it all up, and then we can say goodbye to our audience. So let's take it quickly. I, I wouldn't want to repeat some of the issues that have already been raised. So mm. the issue about, I think, water, availability of water, and then some of the borders that are still exposed mm. where there are no health uh, workers at those posts. Just all right. Those issues. But right after that, then we'll take um, our, some of our Facebook Right. Uh, and uh, WhatsApp messages as well. Um, quickly, okay. uh, okay. let, 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 let's respond to that. On the issue of water, mm -hmm. which I think is very critical, I'm, I'm looking at this from the perspective of the rural-urban divide, where the resources for water availability is more in the urban areas than the rural areas. How are we going to create innovative ways for the rural areas to have facility to wash their hands in fact, from the Margaret Marquardt Hospital, the other day I picked up that they had a Veronica bucket, and it, you know, so anybody entering the hospital had to wash their hands and with soap. But how long can this go? The sustainability in terms of regular flow of water and the cost of soap. So even at the at the domestic level, if they search up the use of soap, how will it affect their regular budget? Those are some of the concerns at the at the right for the urban centers even for the urban centers I might say around the tension on virus there's a regular complaint of water shortages and things like that. so that's a huge area if we have to emphasize hand washing with flowing water we need and the quality of water uh, prof you mentioned it earlier about the uh, uh, quality of water so we have to pay attention to that as a preventive measure then secondly, on the uh, area of border uh, personnel, the immigration service and others, I had reports about the, the absence of PPEs, you know, personal protection equipment, where, which is preventing the immigration officers to really engage the, 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 the persons coming into the country. Th therefore, allowing, we had it on air, allowing people to just interfere because they are scared of being infected. And I would like to emphasize the PPEs on uh, availability for doctors as well and all the health personnel, which I think is very critical. And one of the things you, uh, uh, the, the, the interministerial team can do is to ensure that we, we see visibly some of these things happening with the, some doctors wearing the, the protective equipment and engaged in activities so that we know that, yes, we have the capacity to respond to these things at this at this, at this word of my response. Right. Uh, so, we'll right yeah. so still with the water, actually it's a serious situation uh, because we know that to fight this particular uh, viral infection, water is at the forefront. We have to clean our hands. And so what I would say is that already we have systems in place. You know, the district assembly system is a very beautiful decentralization that allows us to build capacity and also to mobilize. So I think in those areas, what must be done is that first of all, the districts must be aware of the problem. 
and, and mobilize. And if they mobilize, the stakeholder approach, the partnership approach, they can get water to the areas that are needed. We shouldn't expect water to be brought from Accra, mm. you see. So that's a, a very important thing to do. The other thing that I would like to clarify is that when it comes to washing hands, of course you can use water, like pure water or tap water or river water that is not contaminated. You can use all those kind of water to wash hands. So right. that needs to be And clarified. since you're the scientist, let me quickly ask you before I bring uh, Doc into the picture. Um, uh, there were videos circulating on social media of um, some sort of um, spraying around the city of Wuhan in China. And probably that's why the lady is asking, yes. can't we have some chemical to spray into the atmosphere to stop this from happening? It's a, it's, a, it's a nice question. Let me tell you this. There is a company in Ghana that has developed a product, a product that you can actually spray into the air to disinfect. Mm. They have brought it to Noguchi and we are in the process of testing it. Mm. So in the next few weeks, we shall release some new products once they pass a scientific test. So possibilities are there for some of the things that the people are saying. Well, yeah. So the woman's question wasn't funny at all. It, it was, was really it was funny. Very, it was very really funny. Yes. 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 <laughs> so, Dr. Dami, yeah. so you heard the issues. Uh, what are your responses? Yeah, I mean, just on the lighter scale, I think maybe, Prof, you should call up this woman to the Gucci. <laughs> yes, <laughs> see, exactly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think having said that, I think very important things have been said here. And I think obviously one thing I'm learning is, for me, and from a government perspective, one of these, the things of this important meetings is, we're also learning from the Ghanaian public. Because sitting here and listening to the other panelists, there's so much learning yeah. that I've done. Clearly, I think one thing that's coming to mind is we need to be a bit more visible with some of the things we are doing. Though we are doing it, we can do more. Mm -hmm. Maybe when I was coming to this, maybe I should have won a PPE to come and sit here. <laughs> 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 but that's so the light of But having said this, if you have watched, and I said it right from the beginning of this conversation, that's a whole of Ghana approach. Just within the last two days, the Minister of Water and Sanitation went to Ridge Hospital, if I do what, to the MD of Ghana Water Company Limited, to mm. see a first hand mm. and to see how they could act. So every single uh, minister is getting involved in, the, in this battle to ensure this water shortage issues are. And that's why she even actually did a working session, going at first hand to see, right, because Ridge is a treatment center, that's the thing, whether they really, these water supplies are there. And also, the Honorable Minister of Health had commissioned, I think, to go around the whole country to check on all these issues. We've been to the flower border and a few other points. The actual Ghana Immigration Service is part of the UOC, the Major Job Operation Center. Mm. And clearly, they were very clear with us that they've had gaps in border control, especially around the unapproved mm. Mm. So they're also ramping up their actions with certain strategies they can deploy. Of course, we don't have experience that they can advise us, because they know how best to handle this, this, some of these border points. Right. In port health, we've also have to up our game with certain personnel having been pushed in. Of course, we are not at the optimal point, we still have to do more because we need these port health officers in all the various points. I've really taken on board most of the suggestions our colleague in Upper East Region had raised on the unapproved routes. Mm. But I also want to plead with the citizenry because most of the people come across unapproved People in the towns, in the villages, in the communities, they know. And we know that we cannot increase these numbers overnight. And that's why I plan this contingency plan. So for now, we really want to the citizenry in some of this unapproved. And I really like the statement one of the people said. He said, together we will fight. If I've not learned anything at all from this uh, conversation this morning, for me it's a landmark statement. It's together. not about us, it's not about them. Together. Yeah. And I think what we want to do is that we need the trust of society in this battle. And that's why I'm being very plain, to the Ghanaian public, that we need to have trust. Because for me, in epidemics, trust is the most important currency. The moment we lose trust, the battle is, and I'm sure... But, but uh, Honorable was saying that, that that trust must be built. Yes. And that trust must be built through tangible means. We must right. see you to be in action as the health authorities and so on, so that we can build the confidence and the trust that we so much uh, require. Um, uh, Do Dr. Nawani, you must particularly be concerned that this is an issue, in, especially in respect of the bo porous borders, coming from a region, you are an MP in that same region, you must be very concerned. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I still remember two months ago when I made uh, that statement on coronavirus on the floor of parliament. And that time, China had registered about 300 cases mm. with uh, 28 or so of mortalities. I never dreamt that it would get to this stage where we'll be sitting down here and talking about it is it incidents in Ghana here. But we've gone that far. And I think that um, the water situation that he's talking about, this is not a time for us to have water sh shortages. Mm. This is the time for us. It's another, uh, uh, you rem remind your minister, I, I need some more bohos at my place. <laughs> <laughs> and we could use out 100 million. <laughs> uh, he, he's, uh, his budget did not <laughs> mention bohos. <laughs> This time, the bohos will still be there yeah. <laughs> for the people, you know. So just remind them I need some bohos at my place <laughs> because we are not replacing our old methods of uh, washing our hands with, uh, with flowing water, etc., with uh, sanitizers. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Yes, they complement each other. So this is not this is not a time to have shortages of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. But even you see the the, the 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 emphasis of the education is not just washing hands, yeah. but washing hands and the flowing water. Flowing water. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, yes. in, in in those communities in rural areas, yes. even when they're about to eat, they wash their hands in a bowl. Well, no, the next yeah. person comes, washes water. his hand in no, the no, dirty no, no, water, no, no. and so on. Be and be so we must emphasize that yes. as well. Yes, flowing water. Flowing water. Uh -huh. And and under the circumstances, we expect that people should be washing their hands more frequently and hence the demand for water will be high, will be high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes and that is why i'm asking your the minister the budget for my constraints all right okay yes. Who and pays apart from that <laughs> it's not free. So, it's the not free. issue yeah, of the, the border the you consume the more you pay hey, who pays yes. for it mm -hmm. <laughs> the issue of the borders being porous mm -hmm. is quite serious we are fighting that we should control it here and so uh, people are always referring to the uh, airport, airport, airport. Forget about these porous borders. As we speak now, all our neighbors have gotten it. I don't know how they are fighting it, but practically every country is becoming a little bit selfish, even among the European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, between France and Germany, they want to close the border, etc. So we are also having the same problem. If we are able to control all these cases that we have registered, and we're able to manage all these people who have been quarantined, and we still have droplets of cases coming through the border. I'm telling you that we will not succeed anywhere because we will say that we have managed our cases and they will be coming in, creating fresh cases for us. So that is the extent to which we should handle these border cases. Okay. Unless we're able to handle the border cases properly mm. and make sure that, like um, uh, my other panelists have said, it is not good times. If it means sending or increasing the border patrols <coughs> or getting the, 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 the other security forces involved, and not only the immigration or the health personnel involved to ensure that at least if we cannot... Uh, kept it completely, we should be able to reduce it drastically mm. so that we don't have cases that will come in. Uh, just yesterday, I think yesterday or before yesterday, the Deputy Speaker of uh, well, Parliament of Burkina Faso died. Their numbers are a bit higher than our numbers. Yeah. And so we should be worried that this is another source, not only the Kotekwa International Airport. Mm. Right. These, all these porous borders are also sources. Okay. And so, uh, a budget should also be raised for that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Look, I'd like to crave your indulgence, uh, my panel is a bit, um, we've overrun the time we promised we were going to spend here. And that's because of the kind of responses we are getting to this education. And I believe that um, you also are excited to be educating the public, but you also owe it as a duty to the public to educate them the way we are doing. Uh, I can tell you that re the responses are great. And so we would like to take 10 more minutes of your time to wrap it all up. We, we, we actually uh, did not anticipate this, but the, the 
level of participation from the public is so huge, we have to spend a little more time. Uh, so, Selikem, uh, you yeah, have been receiving... We have, we have tons of messages yes, and we so really the, appreciate And, and then there are a, a lot of people who have already been calling in. Exactly. We've asked them to to hold on until we open the phone lines. So we just open the phone lines uh, a, a bit more, but okay. let, let's see what they're saying on okay. social so media. I'm going to so. be very selective and forgive me if I don't read your message because some of the issues have already been dealt with. This one from Patrick uh, Sebe from Central Union says, I say to everybody that I have an antidote which can kill the virus. And I intentionally read it so that we can address mm -hmm. issues like this. The next one says- But he doesn't give details of what antidote? No. And how he can be contacted? No. Okay. Um, it says, please, as we speak, National ID is registering people in crowded conditions in the eastern region. Uh, that's coming from Victor. Uh, Gifty from Malam says, please, should couples sleep together in one bed? Uh, question. And then um, this one says, Richard is saying, has the coronavirus been in existence since creation? If yes, why was it so silent for so long? And then why is it coming out now? Where is it coming from and is so aggressive and ferocious? has coming in from Richard. Final one, Susan is saying, my concern is with the level of education we are giving to the illiterate persons in the market, streets, food, food vendors, and all. They are potential weak points in the curving chain. Uh, can we have stakeholders like market queens, etc., to bring education to the lowest level? Thanks. That's from Susan. So those are just the messages I'll read out for now. Mm, okay, so um, we will pause and take some responses uh, from, from you. So the issues are varied. Uh, maybe, Doc, uh, you may want to, if you have any responses, otherwise then I'll bring Dr. Dami in. Uh, somebody says he's got an antidote. Um, uh, should we believe him or not? Um, well, um, I'll let you know. <laughs> Expand sheet. <laughs> yes, but uh, the issue has to do with uh, the, the training of uh, the market women, etc. I think that should be a state that we should get, get to. Indeed, people are beginning to ask so many questions. Even from uh, the president's statement, they were asking questions. Why is it that uh, the market women have been left, but we are asking uh, school children to go home, or and that the market is probably more crowded? Our markets, yes. All right. This uh, is high. Mm -hmm. Why do we leave them out? Uh, I, well, the, the 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 answer is not that. Um, probably, uh, the, the technocrats have not identified the market uh, as a place that is crowded because in Ghana, particularly all the markets. Uh, but the issue is how to spare some economic activities to go on whilst we still carry out with education, hoping that uh, eventually every unit will be able to identify what they have to do mm. to ensure that that unit functions. For example, when we're sitting down here, we could still talk to the people, but we need to spread out. Probably the market people too have to do the same thing. They can still sell to the public, but they have to spread out. But all this will take time before they are able to have probably enough space <laughs> to implement whatever they want to implement. However, if a decision is immediately taken that all markets should close, probably hunger will kill us earlier than the, the coronavirus. <laughs> you know, so it is the wisdom of uh, possibly the uh, advisors to the president, the technocrats, that this area should be spared for the meantime whilst we continue to carry out our education, whilst we continue to build capacity, etc. And that is why these areas, like the market, etc., is not being closed. Restaurants are not being closed. Um, there are a lot of areas that people can ask that they are not being closed, but we have the churches being closed. Uh, we have the funerals not to take place. There are so many things that questions that can be asked, but <coughs> the issue is to spare economic activities. Why are we going to work? Why is Parliament sitting? Uh, 275 people uh, in, in a room. Why are we sitting? Are we not more than 25? You know, our work must still probably find a way of going on to ensure that there is sanity, to ensure that uh, the, 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 the emergency call by the president is kept or is made into some form of a law that uh, people can be punished whenever. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 
they, they are at fault. Okay. Yes. L so so we, 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 need to, yeah, we, need, we need to understand that aspect uh, properly. Okay. I think that we are moving stage by stage. All right. So what we'll do is, um, uh, so I said, we, we, we have a caller. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you so everybody has a bite before we finally wrap up. Um, a very good afternoon to you. Many thanks for joining us here on uh, the various GBC panels, GTV, and uh, also on uh, GBC News. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling us from? And what's the issue? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Robert, speaking from Tashi. I want to use this Okay, so um, uh, you may have to reposition yourself. Your line is not as clear as we would want it to be. So please reposition I, yourself I hope and it's okay do now. once again. Hello? I hope it's okay now. Uh, right. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I am congratulating you for, you know, sensitizing and educating. Thank you very much. Ghanaians. And uh, my brother, you know, all what we are saying as an expert, they are all, you know, prophylactic measures to actually prevent people from contracting the virus. But there is something very significant that I want to talk about. As we are all putting effort or pragmatic effort to actually combat the virus. We have a situation the National Identification Authority. I have even seen it with my naked eye. Not that anybody is, you know, uh, channeling this information to me at, you know, Eastern region where they are registering people in you know, a crowded, you know, uh, 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 manner. I want your panelists take on this particular Okay. Issue. All right. Thank and you. Secondly, Thank you very much. And so, uh, uh, yes. So his issue has to do with it has been raised, raised here already. already. Uh, the, so the, the the NIA registration. Exactly. So we we've spoken about that um, issue. Yes. So doc, before we receive our next caller, uh, you were about to make a yeah. point. So I, I think I think you are right. The public education. And yesterday, for those of you who listened to the public forum, the briefing with the press by the honorable minister of information, the, all the information service department systems around the regions have been activated now. And also that the market women are part of a public health emergency committee that's also wrapped up now. In fact, information I'm hearing is that even in some of the places, the market women has not joined the crusade in ensuring that this happens. <coughs> Having said that, like I said from the beginning, in emergencies like this, there's always a scaled up response. Like in some settings, when there's A, B, C, D, we move to the yellow button. When there's this, we move to the red button. So like a month ago, we didn't even have these closures we are seeing today in schools and all that. We are here now. And I can, we can assure the Ghanaian public that depending on what we see, it might be moved to the next threshold. That's why I said ongoing measures will be announced. We also want the Ghanaian public to know that we are working hand in hand with global organizations, making sure that Ghana is also applying best practice principles in whatever we do here to enhance our response and to ensure that we are able to do all that we have to do to keep the minutes. All right. We have a caller on the line again. Uh, you tell us your name, your location, and uh, proceed to uh, my name ask is, your my question. My name is Prince. I'm calling from Wilshire. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, really good for you to educate us on this particular uh, virus that is happening in the whole world. As a matter of fact, um, your panelists have really done well for educating us to this part. What I will want you to do is that continuously, these are kind of people that you have to be bringing them to the radio and then discussing this particular so that those of course, this GBC will always here, bring the right people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those of us here can understand it well. You know, there are some individuals who come and then politicize it wrongly, and it does not help Ghanaians. Again, you know, individuals are raising the issue on the NIA. I believe uh, already they are undertaking this process. And so I believe maybe we can communicate, you individual can communicate to them. If there is a need to maybe, you know, cut it off, maybe to another time, they will be able to do that. If they are able to arrange, they said that maybe as the president was saying that 25, 25 individuals, if they can be giving them numbers, so that uh, these 25 will be doing it, later 25 will be doing it. I believe that gradually they will be able to do that. For All right. Them. I thank you very much for educating me. Thank, thank you, you very too. much. And so you, you so that the, question needs to be addressed. Yeah. If yeah. you can give us a response to that, why yeah. is the NIA still registering people? Yeah. In yeah. that, I, I, I think that this is a total disrespect of the president's directives. And I think that to, in some sanctions, authoritative sanctions must be brought to the institution because from what I listened to and I read and continue to read, 
no institution, no organization, no individual must gather people around with numbers beyond. Okay, people. fortunately we have the MP here. He was part of the group so, that passed legislation. Did the legislation exclude the NIA? No, that's how I, I, I you know when I was trying to answer the market women's question, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to let people understand the president or the, 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 the people to understand that yes, the president still wants certain key uh, um, functions to still go on, and that has to do with the economic activities. That is my judgment. Mm -hmm. Yes, we should still have the economic activities going on. But with the, NIA, uh, with the NIA, you see, I believe the, the authority, the Ghana Medical Association has come out. It's yes. a, uh, an organization that has come out. Mm -hmm. I'm a member and I believe that uh, they should listen to them. You know, the, um, NIA, the NIA, NIA hopes that they will be able to observe the fiscal distance. And when, as they've started, they realized that, you see, at this stage, this is not a time to use force. Any type of force that you try to use at this stage, it's going to backfire. When I say force, they can implement that. But with the crowding taking place, they need the military, they need the police, etc., to make sure that this thing is observed. All right. uh, and well, that is, yes. I believe that as a state, hmm. We don't want at this stage to get to a stage, uh, we've not gotten a, a stage where we want to uh, bring in uh, these forces to okay, help we understand us you, Honorable. implement let's, let's, any policy. Let, let's see and what they, they've, other got to, they, they've got to realize that, mm. you know, the best thing is to follow the President's instructions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another call on the line. You tell us your name, your location, and uh, what uh, your question is. This is Razak speaking from Mamodi. All right. Please, uh, the government has to look at the two collectors. I think the two collectors, some of two, two collectors, the two good collectors. Yes. Okay, I I'm, I'm straining my ear, yes, to hear you well. If you can, if, Okay, so the, the toll booth is, is what your issue is. So he has also talked about the issue of the toll booth. It means it's a major source of concern to, to many yeah. Ghanaians. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Prof, you may want to... Yeah, uh, actually, if we are looking at the toll booth, mm. what I will say is that, you know, anything that is changing hands, already we have significant information about coronavirus now how it can survive on different surfaces. So it can be on money currency. Therefore, any currency you receive from anybody, you should consider it as potentially contaminated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you receive the money and you keep it in a certain safe place, the next thing should be sanitizing. And if everybody is doing that, then we'll prevent any contamination from spreading. Because we can't say that we will not take money, <laughs> you know. Okay. So I think that should be a very important precaution mm. there. The other point I want to make here is that uh, somebody said that I have a, 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 a treatment or an whatever, antidote. Yes, an antidote. antidote. <laughs> now when somebody says such a thing, we could ignore it as you know, minor or trivial, mm. but I think we shouldn't do that. What a person should do is to contact the Food and Drugs Authority or contact the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And, and, and bring uh, the information on what he has, and then we can do further investigations. All right. the, the other thing is um, somebody asked a very interesting question, but it's a community question. The question was, so does it mean couples should not... Uh, Copulate? Uh, yes, uh, should <laughs> not sleep together. <laughs> it's something that you can ignore, but the communities, when they ask questions, it's better to address yeah. the questions. Yeah. What I'll say f first of all about couples is that couples must also comply with all the preventive measures we are talking about. Couples should not shake hands. Once you've come out of your bedroom and you are in the normal, you don't say, oh, that's why this is my wife, so I can shake hands, but you, I can't shake hands. No, 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 it's wrong. You don't shake hands. You sanitize. You yes. keep the isolation distance, everything. The expectation, therefore, is that you have not become infected. Mm -hmm. So when you go home and you clean up properly, 
You can be together. Right. I, I hope you get so it. Clean up yeah, properly. clean up properly. Then, then you can be right. together. <laughs> but you have to make sure that there are no chances of. So we may have together. to create another hashtag <laughs> when it comes to this. <laughs> <laughs> clean up before you get together. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yes, uh, Doc, you, you wanted to say something um, when, when the calls, before the calls started coming in. Yeah. The, the, uh, and I'll consider that as your wrapping up um, uh, conclusion remark, and then I'll take the rest to conclude as well. Yeah, I think I just want to make the point to Ghanaian that, like someone said, John Bigot Globe, that there are stages of a country. The age of pioneers, when the pioneers come in, they are more selfless, they build together. And then the age of conquest, they conquer the age of commerce, where business has to flourish. The age of intellectualism, where we, we sit down and we talk like this. Mm. But unfortunately, say in the age of intellectualism, there's a lot of talk, but very little action. Then the empire dec decays and decline. So my prayer is that we move our effort into the age of the pioneers. This is the spirit we need now, the spirit of the pioneers, where they look at action and action and action, and trust amongst ourselves. And okay. that's why we are trying to be open to learn from Ghanaians and to us with community. Right. A lot of myths are being peddled around, but I like what Prof also said. If you discover something, let's not ignore. Bring it forward to the authorities. For you know, it might be the magic bullet yeah. mm. that we might work with. Right. Exactly. But let's work together as a whole, as an entity, as a country, to ensure that posterity doesn't remember us strongly, that we stood in history and turned it tight. All right. And um, just before I bring Honorable Nawini in, we have another caller, and that will be our very final caller. You tell us your name, your location, and the issue. I'm Felix Dakwamu, talking from Pukwai Pijama. All right. Uh, please, uh, as things have gone on now, we have funeral, whereby we are to take our coffers, our uh, our bodies from the mortuary, and we have been given this up to uh, four, uh, four weeks. So, in this case, uh, we, 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 we lost the, the caller there. But, okay. Is the government going to support them? Oh, okay. All right. Um, unfortunately, we, these are the issues we were hoping that the deputy minister would be able to respond to. I don't believe that the panel here are in the capacity to respond to that question. This question has to do with... Okay, I don't know if you may, yeah, um, but yes, he says... So see that, um, yeah. There is a, a distance over there where, um, you know, we can carry out a funeral but with 25 people, yes, or, or the maximum of 25, the maximum of 25 people. people, yeah, I believe that that is in the wisdom of uh, let's say people who, who, who die. Um, not everybody can keep his body in the mortuary, and even in uh, in our religious uh, parlance, mm. we have the Muslims who would wish to bury their body immediately. Yeah. So, rumor has been made, but that we only limit the numbers mm. for that. When a lot of people are talking of, <laughs> I'm using this opportunity to explain that a lot of people are talking of compensation to uh, people like, you know, in America, mm -hmm. I've heard that uh, they'll give money to individual households, etc., to cushion them against this. In the UK, to the yes, same thing. in the UK, to the same thing, yeah. yeah. But in Ghana here, uh, I believe that at the moment, as a parliamentarian and knowing what is there, I believe that. The struggle now is how to raise the money, <laughs> you know, how to get the hundred million mm. to, 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 to really fight, uh, use it for the direct fight against the coronavirus. All right, but his question had yes. to do with, okay, so for those so, families who have dead persons mm -hmm. in mortuaries yes. who may have had plans already, but because of this announcement want to hold on to the plans in the time being with the bills at the mortuary and so on be catered for by the government uh, when the, 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 uh, I, when you, you you die you go out of health care <laughs> by uh, the, the, the national health insurance authority do not pay for a dead body True. we know that health financing in this country is done by the by the government through the national health insurance authority <laughs> And when you die, you are out of insurance. Yeah. So that bill yeah. currently yeah. will not be paid <laughs> by uh, this thing. So it's the family that pays. Okay. And that is why you have to take the decision whether you will still continue to keep it there 
and carry out a very mass, you know, grandiose uh, occasion, or you have, go and pick your body and use about 25 people to bury. That is not what is available okay. to... Uh, right, uh, we really have to start wrapping up now. Yeah, but there's uh, a final suggestion yes. here. It says mm -hmm. a vital one to the president. Um, it says that the USA has issued a thousand dollars to its citizens out of the 850 billion fund created to fight the pandemic i also think our government can assist in the same routine by giving its workers a tax-free salary okay. for this month and the next since we are being quarantined and also to issue an order to financial institutions to stop any form of loan deduction on government workers for the time being I think that I think that Very interesting. We, we still want to be in normal times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let us agree whether we are responding to a crisis situation or we are not. <laughs> if we are not, then we can go by and give money and bury our <laughs> people and go to school. Okay. But we are in some form of crisis, crisis and responding to the crisis. Mm -hmm. Therefore, some of the questions do not count anymore. Until that phase, mm -hmm. crisis response phase, is over. No, but here, the, the caller's uh, the, the call uh, concern, Doc. Uh, uh, well, with stimulus yeah. Yeah, package. No, no, that, no but the caller's concern, one of them, uh, mm -hmm. if you, maybe we all missed that, was the fact that when people actually go for bodies now, uh, the, the mortuaries tell them, we cannot give you the bodies because there's um, a, a law against funerals now. That is the... No, so, I, yes, I, that, that's what he said. No, then, then no, that's no, not, no, that's no, not no, right. That's not because right. Because we mm. can go for your body and have a small barrier go and go postpone your big funeral yeah. later. So, well, I, think, I think that's... We have to wrap up in three minutes now. Um, uh, quickly, let yeah. me take closer remarks. Maybe well, uh, 30 seconds? Yes. Well, we have to consider this moment as a crisis response moment. We need to get everybody in that mood and that we have to respect all the directives of, of the protocols of prevention and also address the issues of response and control, which means that we have to surge up our testing, our, our surveillance, our isolation and treatment. Once we get that done, then we will be responding appropriately to the to the to the virus spread. Finally, we need support. We, I think that money has to be made available, and uh, we must have some command and communication effectiveness in this process. Once we trust the process, citizens will follow uh, appropriately. Prof, yeah. So at this stage, it's obvious from all that has happened around the world that testing is one of the most important tools to be able to understand how to manage the situation of corona in any community or in any country. So we should remember that the testing is very important. We should remember to release appropriate resources for testing. And then we should also remember to release appropriate resources for all the facilities that are needed to go with the, the testing and the management. This is very key. And then secondly, we need to remember that the community must work together. Because without community working together, we cannot contain the situation. True. Finally, the last thing I'll say is that certain companies have already started taking some bold initiative to provide some donations and things to uh, institutions that need them. <coughs> for example, the University of Ghana Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research will receive a donation from um, uh, Unilever yesterday, some, some antiseptics, which is a good thing to do. We also received a donation from an enterprise you know, group of companies, which is a good thing. I will encourage various companies and things that would like to complement and help the system to work to do so. All right. Doc, um, I can come back to you again, another 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah, I think we are, like, before I agreed, we are not in business as usual times. And we can't do the same thing the same way. So Ghanaians should know that we are in a time that we need to do things differently. And like one of our greatest icons on the African continent said, Nelson Mandela, that it's always impossible until it is done. Mm. We need to make impossibilities become possibilities. So let's work together and let's trust each other to ensure this happens. Look. Yeah, as a parliamentarian, um, I would say that 
uh, this is the time for us to, in a bipartisan way, have the government of the day to solve the problems. And like uh, former President Mahama said, this is the time for all of us to unite. And even has offered that the former appointees of government uh, should make their expertise available to all and sundry to help contain this menace. And today I'm happy to see actually uh, Honorable Prosper Banner here as one of the panelists. And I'm hoping that with Prof, with our technocrats, and with we, the politicians, we should be able to work very hard to contain the situation. Thank you very much, Silicon. Of course, it's been um, three solid hours yes. of uh, <laughs> solid conversation. Uh, we thought we were going to do two hours, but the, yes, um, so thank you very much. Uh, Silicon, so let's wrap up now. What, what, what would be your closing well, remarks? My, my message will go to the media. Mm -hmm. Let's be circumspect in the language we're using at this time. The novel coronavirus is okay. We don't need to add the deadly, the ferocious, the dangerous <laughs> virus, all these things create um, panic. Let's get the education ourselves as media persons and put out the correct information. Get the right resource people also to speak to the issue so that as we educate the public, we reduce the fear and not uh, spread that fear, but have calm. <laughs> and uh, again, the authorities have said that, um, and, and Doc, uh, Dr. Adami did refer to that as well, uh, that bell shape uh, when you're doing the statistics, that uh, the figures might go up uh, a little more than the current nine, uh, but that does not mean that we should panic because in uh, you know, times of pandemics, uh, you will find a rise, but as efforts are being made, then the, 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 the figures begin to come down and plateau at a point. So. Uh, even though we have been asked to consider this as a warlike situation, uh, panic could make it worse than it already is. And so we need calm at this point in time. Um, this event, uh, this program was supported uh, by uh, Allied Oil. Allied Oil says, why pay more to drive more? At Allied, you pay less to drive more. Allied's drive more fuel is currently the lowest on the market, drive to the nearest Allied fuel service station and fill up the difference. Drive more, more kilometers at no extra cost. Allied with you all the way. At this point, we say thank you to our panelists, um, uh, Honorable Prosper Bani. Honorable Prosper Bani, seated to my immediate right, is the former uh, crisis management.